You know, like when there's like a meal that technically tastes bad, but you eat it because the, the technicality of having it is like there's multifacets to it. And so you're supposed to appreciate the multifacets rather than the overall picture. No, I eat like Taco Bell when I eat out. OK, I have no idea what you're talking about. So a- example. Taco Bell menu. Limit yourself to that. Wait, OK, fine, 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 fine. Um, I don't eat at Taco Bell. I have no relation. Can't do it. Welcome, man, to another sit down little session here um, of uh, unresolved textual tension where myself, Katie, and my handsome bitch. Katie has on something that looks relatively like a jean jacket. So she thinks she's cool and from like the 40s and a counterculture rebel. So she's like, sup, man. Yeah, like I haven't washed my jeans in two months. That's usually how long you take to wash things. Anyway, this is unresolved sexual tension. I'm your ruggedly handsome host. And that is Katie. Um, she looks That's like a hobo so... a lot of time. It's a pivot. This book is The Warm Hands of Ghosts by Catherine Arden. Now, this was going to require a little bit of lore to understand. But back in the before time, I was like, hey, Maria, Katie, do you guys want to start a book club and we'll record it and release it as a podcast? And they were like, sure, dope. That's how they talked. The second book we did was uh, a book by Catherine Arden called uh, The Bear and the Nightingale. Um, at the time, I was much harder on it than maybe I would be now after having read so many terrible books. But even at the time, oh I remember Catherine Arden as being like, she's a very talented writer. That book has really wonderful atmosphere. And she's really able to get you in the mind of um, the the world of the time place yeah. that's in. And that really helps a lot in contextualizing the character's actions. And She's very moody. She's very moody, but she's also very good at getting you into the cultural mindset of yeah. like the father is like, not a great guy and maybe or maybe not kind of grape someone because he doesn't really understand how consent works. But you're also she's able to put you in the mindset of like, oh, this is 12th to 15th century Russia somewhere. This is just how society functions. These people are a product of their society. I was really impressed by that. But then we never really read the sequels because the sequels are like more high fantasy e, from what I understand or more like adventure e. Um, and also at the time we had other books to do like the Savior series which kind of made the channel blow up. Um, but now I saw she was coming out with a new book and it was called The Warm Hands of Ghosts. And it was supposed to be a World War I ghost story. And I was like, okay, I'm here for it. This I think she can do really well. And we'll see how much those predictions were fulfilled uh, in a moment when Katie gives her thoughts on Catherine Arden. When we read The Bearer and the Nightingale, I really, one thing that really caught my attention was Arden's ability to kind of make this like very genuine feeling uh, allure, like mystical allure when it comes to the lore and stuff of her world. Um, It doesn't feel cheesy. It doesn't feel contrived. It feels kind of like really part of the setting, like kind of Will said. Will came at it from a different perspective, um, but it's kind of the same thing, you know? Like the tone is great. The world building is great. The characters are pretty good. Although I will say like what she does with characters, at least in The Bear and the Nightingale, I just remember, cause it's been a very long time now, um, but I just remember Towards the end, I felt very, it felt very like, not, cl- not, and you said there's sequels, right, actually? From what I understand, the sequels really don't have anything to do with the cast of the first book besides the main character. Because the first book is like a very atmospheric retelling of this girl Vasya growing up and having to deal with like these weird, um, Fae stuff. Spirit, yeah, Fae stuff. And then there's like a zombie grandma at the end that's horrifying. And then, and it builds up and it builds up. And then all of a sudden there's a random hot fairy guy who gives her a horse and you're like wait i thought we were in the middle of a horse story what's going on and the hot guy who gives her a horse is in the rest of the series he's like a faking i think from what i understand so like that didn't really compel me no 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 i would want to read that i'm interested to see what direction it goes into it's not the hot fake king thing it's the transition from that kind of like magical realism of like oh we live in like the countryside where there are certain traditions and things that must be followed we have the kindly fae we have the not kindly fae all that stuff transitioning into high fantasy sounds kind of like a natural progression for certain kind of story um and i'd really like to like you know uh, again if you want to be so inclined to compare it to akatar um that is basically kind of what happens a little bit there but you know what i mean like i i'm okay with that 
telling trans- the series well to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, once you got about three fifths the way through the Bear and the Nightingale, I feel felt like there was a certain focus that the first parts of the story had that mm-hmm. I felt like were becoming unfocused, and now we are refocusing on something else. So I guess I do have the same problem you do. It's just. It, it's also the the style of the like I just felt really like I was watching it through a camera, and a hardcore like came out of focus, and then just I never got to refocus in on the things I cared about that it established me to care about for the first half. I think the second half of the book, or or I don't remember what percentage of it because this was like in the before time, so it was like two years. But like when I heard that like World War One ghost story came about, I was like, oh okay, this could be really interesting. But to me, I think this book carry some of the problems that Baron the Nightingale had in terms of... Okay, so basically speaking, I think Catherine Arnott is fantastically t- talented. Uh, she's a really great prose writer. Uh, she's good with characters. She's really good with dialogue in a way that... Oh, like, God, I know. Like, this book has so much great World War One y type dialogue in it that feels very authentic and of the yeah, time Authentic. And place. I wanted to say authentic before. Genuine means the same thing, but authentic is the word. She's really good at that, and those things in the book are really good. Uh, my main problem is that this is two books one of which is good and then the other of which kills all the tension from the first one. Oh wow that's so interesting i actually think it's perfect i know um and the other thing is that i think the ending kind of fumbles in terms of the themes she was going for and like i don't I know how it ends in the last five minutes it's pretty much the, just what you would think i got to vinta and uh jimmy talking i didn't really understand this book and it felt like i couldn't quite figure out what the author was going for until what? Until the there's a, a an afterward actually where she talks about her inspirations for it and then everything clicked into place in terms of what she was trying to do and I think it actually works less but we'll we'll talk I, I don't think this is a, a a bad book um I don't even think this is like a I, I just think that structurally it's a little bit more messy than it needs to be but there's a lot of things I really did like about this book and I found it way more readable than everything else we've read. Um, So why don't you start by talking about the things you really did like about it? One thing I really, really enjoyed about this book is it made me cry. And uh, I don't care. Willie, God, William is such a, God, he is such a negative Nancy. He can't even engage with the barest hint of something sentimentally beautiful. You're misgendering me by calling me Nancy. (laughs) What a dumb (laughs) fucking I really enjoyed this book. It's because there's something that happened. And I don't know what it is about it. I'll, I'll mention it. I'll go into more detail later when we get to the scene. Uh, it's because this is the second time I've been given this kind of a scene, like literally verbatim almost. And it's the second time I've cried when I've been given, honestly, like <sighs> the scene I'm talking about that made me cry is nothing legendary. It is nothing like mind blowing, but there's something about the themes involved that when I saw a similar scene before, it also really pulled at me. So it just was really something I loved. So it this book contains a lot of elements I love, um, including like certain choices, certain choices that the um, that the characters end up making. I really there was every character made interesting choices that I really enjoyed that I felt were like dynamic and fun and some were expected of course it's because then you get to know what she's going for for the character archetype but whatever I really love that Laura our main character one of our two main characters is so decisive in her actions it's so refreshing to have a character that just does things and it, and she's realistic though I feel like I felt like I've had her way like I saw her alcoholism I saw her like <laughs> faults and stuff like that and I just really was like wow I love this character um I liked how the story progressed I think there is uh, I'll get into that because that's a criticism um I like the way the story progressed in the way the pacing was except for towards the beginning um, but otherwise, once a certain thing happens, I really like that atmosphere. Once I get to the chateau, which we'll discuss, um, once we get to the chateau, I felt like this story bloomed for me. It was like, ah, uh, mm, um, and then there's another thing I'm going to say. I am in love with the ro- the main romance of this, or what I perceive as the main romance. Of- well, I guess it's not categorized as the main romance. Um, I love Laura and Dr. Jones. In my head, I kept thinking of him as Dr. Josh for some reason, which was very funny, but go ahead. No, his name's Steven. I love Steven. I love Steven. He is a great character. He's one of my favorite male romances we've read thus far. 
Um, and I really like him and Laura together specifically. And even though it's not the main thing of the book, it's like a little background blip. I think the blip was handled really nicely because it didn't, that would, there was no drama in that relationship because there didn't need to be drama. That's not what was pulling the story. And I just think she handled that really good. I also love the title. I love what the title means. And I, from what I understood the book to be telling me in two different voices, or I, I got two specific themes out of this, two very hyper specific themes out of this. I don't know if it's what she was going for, but the two themes I got were really, really awesome. And I liked it. And I liked everything about this book, except mostly the beginning. That's interesting because in, in, I, I really didn't have problems with the beginning too much. I was but... fine. It's fine. The premise of this book is, like I said, World War One with ghosts, kind of. So there is this girl called Laura, and she was a nurse in the army during World War One. She's Canadian, ugh. And um, they, she got hit with a shell, shell in her leg, so she got sent back to whatever Canada is called. Like we get called the states, or they just like the state anyway. Um, and then a big ship explodes and she's been like helping out and where we meet Laura, she, her parents have just died in this big ship explosion that happened. She is not, she's still kind of suffering from PTSD. Th this book makes a lot of use of the whole trope of like, they heard a loud noise and all the veterans immediately like that thing, which does happen, but is also a little bit of a tired trope to me. Um, and she is very like, oh, I'm super competent in the military. And, you know, the soldier can leave war, but war never leaves the soldier. I'm making fun of it a little bit. I actually really like Laura. I think this is written really well. I think the author is able to make her a really compelling character throughout. That Go being ahead. said, I do think she goes overboard and saturates it in some places and it gets kind of cheesy in those places. OK, so she does the thing that like i don't know why people do this but they do this thing where it's like oh i was they, they like to it, they almost like to channel their adolescent angst through military veterans of being like oh i'm different than everyone now they just don't understand like that kind of feeling and she like, borderlines that that's the thing though is that she does it just enough for you to notice her doing it but she doesn't go so hard to ruin the character. I agree. Uh, to me, I would have liked it if she had pulled back on it a little bit because to me, it made it made the book feel a little more booky and a little less realistic. Yes, um, agreed. That's the only time I got taken out of the book is when they were when she was talking like about. Like, there's this one scene where Laura is talking to this other character, and she's like, you don't know what it's like. It's going to be like this. But yeah, we've been told that a million times already. And it's like, don't, no more. You don't have to do it anymore. I get it. Yeah, it was just like a little bit much. But again, I, I think for the most part, Laura, uh, Laura's entire plot line, I just really like. I think it's really oh, good. Um, and basically, the thing is that she has to deal with the fact that her brother they don't know what happened to him he went missing like her brother who was in world war one as well he was an infantryman in some other place um he went missing and she hasn't been able to hear from him but also she hasn't gotten like his dog tags, which they call identification tags because they're lame. You would think like, oh, that's a really compelling, interesting mystery. What happened to her brother? And it is, but also we get to see that mystery because the other half of the book is playing through in the past what happened to her brother sequentially up in, until the two plot lines converge. But I think she did a really good job in choosing when to portray in the time difference because Laura's storyline is being told in the future whereas her brother's storyline is being told in the past but it's also staggered so like we get scenes that we see at very small intervals of or we get knowledge given to us of things that have already come to pass for a character we get the perspective of that we're just slightly in his timeline before those things come to pass too so we still have like this middle parentheses of events that we don't know that happened that have already happened for laura but that haven't happened for her brother and so i think that choice actually helps in her regard because you know i don't like multiple perspectives but i think it it it, it serves a very important purpose in this book for me i found it to be very ineffective in that the second plot line with him really destroyed a lot of the tension of what was going on with Laura. I think there is a value to having some of what was going on with her brother. Um, like about if her brother's plot line had stopped halfway, I would have been like, oh, this is an interesting, compelling mystery. Um, but then the, the brother plot line keeps going to explain like the more 
ghost supernatural parts of the book. And I was like, this is like, and and so there's parts where Laura is on the trail and she's trying to figure it out. And you're like, okay, but I know what's happening. Can you hurry up and catch up to where I'm at so that we can move the plot forward? There was a small bubble of that that I got irritated with. And that is when we talk about it in the plot. It's about like three-fifths through the book or yeah. so. Um, yeah, that part right there, I think something else should I, – I, whether you cut some information, you slow down his chapters, and you don't show a lot until a little later, that's fine. But yeah, I would agree with you on that. No, we agree on that. The only thing is, is I think his perspective is really required because – it's necessary. A lot of things wouldn't matter as much and wouldn't make sense if we didn't know, if we didn't empathize with her brother, Jimmy, and if we didn't get a certain perspective from that. It's because we're supposed to be- Isn't her brother Freddy? Oh, Freddy. Did I say Jimmy? My bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, Freddy. Um, anyway, Freddy. Um, Wilfred. I, I remember that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I think- she really wanted you to feel torn into the old world and the quote unquote new world being world war you know like the world mm -hmm. that freddy and laura are part of versus the world that uh Fa is it Falong? Faland, i thought yeah Faland. okay of anyway whatever he is i got like super fey vibes from that by the way oh he's very clearly the devil like spoiler alert he is the devil the devil you think he, he talks about f having given man a gift and then falling and hurting his leg and then earlier in the book they were talking about paradise lost where lucifer fell from heaven i missed some pieces of it all yeah. it's because of how fast i was listening to it well to be honest when you're listening to an audiobook sometimes you just zone out for a minute or you like have to do a thing for a minute while you're doing something else and then you lose critical information and it's very hard to go back so honestly i'm going to i love this book enough that i'm going to buy a physical copy and reread it because i really would like to reread it um but that being said that that you know it's funny that changes that doesn't really change my perspective at all it's because i i mean obviously he was a devil devil ish figure so i that yeah. still came through but i mean it's that, still plausibly deniable you could still be like well he's something like the, the devil or something yeah that's that see that's what my problem was is bit. i didn't hear or catch the paradise lost things um and then uh I wasn't paying attention. Well, so part time. of the, the book is that uh, Laura's parents were very religious and they believed yes. in an apocalypse. Yes. And so you yes. get snatches of that a little bit in both of their plot lines of them both thinking back about and that's how they frame things a little bit. But I really would have liked it if she pushed into that more. Oh, my God. Yes. That's one thing I... Dude, that's the problem, though. So I feel like he's so because we read another book of hers where there were fairies, right? So that already left an imprint on me as a consumer of her literature. And so when we went into this, that imprint is still on my mind. So granted, I missed some key important things. Obviously, he was I thought he was a devil figure because of the fiddle, because of the you know, the uh, the vampiric almost nature that he had, the eye thing, the way the he's gayness. described, the beautiful, like, like cloudy hair and everything and how he was ethereally, you know, like it all falls into place, right? Mm -hmm. The shiny eye thing. Um, but I felt like it was so hyper specific on certain details of him that I just don't have the religious background for, I guess, that I, I, I might have confused it for some lore building or whatever. Um, that happened to me a lot during my bachelor's. It's because I don't know anything about Christian. <laughs> her, her cultural background is more um a preacher in a tent. Yeah, no, no, I know I know that. I know Lord, that. Lord, Lord, Lord. Oh look, Lord. I know enough. Yes, I know. I because they took her them out of school because there was a meteor. Uh, yeah. and they thought it was the end. Like, you know, I love that detail, by the way. Actually, in the end of the so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about her afterward, because again, I feel like that's a good guide for what she was trying to achieve with the book. She talks about how World War One was very much an apocalypse. Um, she also listened to the same 11 hour podcast about World War One that I did because she oh, name really? calls it and several of the specific stories in that podcast are in this book. That's so cool. Yeah. Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Uh, something of Armageddon is, is what his is called. It's a, the thing about it is I was sort of spoiled because I had listened to that and that is such a oh, gripping. Wow. That gives you such a gripping feeling of the what it was the like carnage and the Armageddon and of what was going on that this book to me didn't quite deliver on it. I think as much as the author wanted it to and it needed to for the story she was kind of trying to tell i think the reason that she failed in that is that she showed her hand too much she couldn't do the horror aspect of it yeah 
A little bit. You know what I mean? Again, uh, there she over she over described a lot of things. And the thing is, it's interesting because when she was talking in the afterward about how World War One was the end of a world for a lot of people and it was horrible in terms of the amount of death and it was the destruction of one world and building another, I get like shivers. I'm like, oh. But I never got those shivers while I was reading the actual book. Like, again, the, the setting here is significantly better than like in Divine Rivals, which was supposed to be World War One y and just straight up did not feel like World War One or, or or that kind of warfare of that time period whatsoever. So like she does do she has good atmosphere. Uh, Arden has good atmosphere. Again, she has very good dialogue. And I thought like, oh, as a story taking place in World War One, this is pretty good. But I don't think she was able to achieve the vividness she wanted in this book. And it very much, the thing is, is Will saying this, it's because it very much comes through that she wanted that, I feel like. Like, mm -hmm. it was, like, in every moment that she goes to describe some atrocity of the war, she hyper fixates on the details, which now, with that documentary keeping in mind, that makes a lot of sense. But I think, again, the problem is, is you can give a lot of detail of something without over-explaining it. And the problem is, is I feel like, I just don't feel like her approach was correct in some of it. I just felt like, I feel... <sighs> Yeah, I don't I, I know. know it just, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's, it's, just, it's it's a, a little, little, it's a little too much. There's also not quite enough contrast in terms of one of the, th like, it, it, it's one of these things where I thought it was good until I realized that was what she was trying to write, and then I realized that's why I have problems with the last half of the book is that it really depends on her it, this feeling like an apocalypse, and I didn't quite get that. I feel like she had a lot of goals for this book. There's so many different themes being mixed in. We've got the the tale of the devil, but also it is very fae like. Like you know, they're dipping mm -hmm. into an unknown. No, realm. for sure. Or like a Cthulhu man creature thing or whatever. The point is the other thereabouts unknown whereabouts unknown or whatever um so that's what the title of like some of the uh, uh chapters are when they're telling you the locations of like where each of the characters are but anyway um so i felt like so you know you have that like theme where it's like this like oh it's not just magical realism it is another magical realm and there is a devilish character and he's very like like Lori, you know, legendary. And then you've got Laura, which is like kind of like <laughs> and uh, not a Hallmark movie, but like <laughs> kind of like, you know, she goes to find her brother, falls in love, has a friend that kills uh, something, something. I'm not giving spoilers yet. <laughs> Good job that you were about myself. to. <laughs> I know. Uh, and, you know, like I, she's got like more of an advent. So she's got the adventure story where she saves something and does the thing. Uh, her brother's got the sad, morose, poetic, like I'm being forgotten into the past in the fey world. Uh, type of like vibe thing then we've also got other characters that we care about and the setting itself which is world war where we're getting all the atrocities of war which is another theme that intertwines itself with the other ones so we're getting three very very different like but I like it. I like it. I just don't think she 100% mixed them well in some places in order to get the thing that she wanted. Yes. I don't think they complement each other is the thing. I think she she's... I think me, she did a good job with it. I, I I'll think dis it, I'll, I'll disprove this whole Katie talking thing she's doing right now in a little bit. Um. <laughs> I just want to say, like... I think you are 100% correct. I think these themes don't naturally go together and usually they'd be a lot more frictiony than they are in this story. But I think what she created is so lovable for me personally that it worked. Again, I don't think this is a bad book. I think this can work for people. I mean, I, I, I like, again, she's a very, she, it's funny about uh, Lee Bardugo and Six of Crows. I said um, that I think she's a very skilled writer, but not a very competent one. And somebody in the comments said that maybe coordinated would be a better one or a better word for it or whatever. But I, I kind of stand by competent. Um, and Catherine Arden is like that if you raise the levels on both. She's more skilled and she's more competent, but there's still a little bit of a gap between, I feel like, yeah. her talent for dialogue and prose and compelling characters and her ability to plot things well um, and, and, and mix those themes in. I think she just wanted to do too much with this, honestly, and I think that's kind of part of the problem. Going back to um, the brother's plot line, right? Basically, he attacked a trench and then, like, a trench... Okay, the other thing I have to mention that's I think maybe spoiled this 
book for me a little bit is I am really into military history. I'm, I'm very aware of like, okay, that kind of makes sense and it kind of doesn't or like here and there. She got a lot of small details, right? And it's really mm -hmm. masterful how she weaved those in. But um, but like, A, I watched that 11, I listened to that 11 hour podcast about the First World War. Um, I recently read a whole um, blog series about the misconceptions people have about the war which actually because he's a real military historian versus dan carlin who did the podcast who's more just an enthusiast um so in in this this blog series i was reading he was talking about some of the things people get wrong about the war and like a few of those kind of pop up here it's um for those wondering it's uh the blog blog is called a uh, collection of unrepentant pedantry i think um, and it is by Brett Devaru. She leans very heavily on the trope of World War One generals just didn't care about their men. They tossed them around like coins. And like that is true to an extent. There are some incredibly incompetent World War One generals, and they're also like there are some I'm sure who didn't much care about their men. But like for the most part, World War One generals were trying really hard to figure out how to break trench lines and to um, minimize casualties. And like, it's more just a case that with the technology involved, the weight was far, far more towards the defender than it was the attacker. Um, in that blog series I was talking about, he basically, cause in, in the last um, blog, he goes through the different methods of trying to break the trench stalemate that the different generals tried. And that basically none of them worked. Like there just isn't really a way to do it at that time period with that uh, technology level, you really need to be like 10 to 15 years later when tanks have gotten better and you can have like radios and stuff and, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so like that made it so that one of the main themes of this book, which is generals don't care about their men, Ugh, just didn't hit for me. I was like, eh, that's not really accurate. Like, and, and the thing is, books don't need to be 100% accurate. I've, I maintain that they're about telling a story. But I think that's one of the things that personally for me made it ring a little untrue at times. I think it's also one of these cases where uh, she didn't really go into... So at the end of the book, the book wants to talk a lot about how systems affect people and how systems are what's going on instead of actual people. But then the book actually spends no time really exploring those systems. So it's just kind of a vague thesis, not a thing she's explored. She hasn't explored like the brutality of like... um one of the systems involved that made it brutal. I'm sorry, guys, I, I didn't sleep basically last night. So my brain's a little bit tired. But like, and that's the thing that that the that 11 hour podcast got across really well is that these were just like systems that marched forward and you get an inexorable sense of like, the weight of history, the steel clad toes marching forward one by one. And I think that's what she wanted to mimic. But then that's not what the story explores. It doesn't explore like the bureaucracy of what a bayonet charge was like, or, you know, what, um, what, what the system involved in place for like military promotions to get people into place who aren't necessarily good at their jobs are like, those are all the systems that actually make the war so impersonal and horrific and she doesn't really go into that she does have a lot of really good um detail uh like just so much it's wonderful she has she knows exactly what's going on with her setting and how people think and that's really cool and lends to the credence of the world but those are some of the things that just for me i think made my reading of it a little bit different than katie's katie is not actually here right now she mysteriously had to go somewhere else and we don't know where and we're not gonna say but while she's gone i will say that basically what happens is that laura's brother uh charged a grenade uh not charged a grenade charged a bunker hit it with a grenade and then it also got hit by a big shell like an artillery strike at the same time and the whole bunker actually turned on its side and trapped him and a german man in the dirt like underground so they're trapped uh the german guy is called winter and also i should say that the audiobook uh, like there's so many good voices all of the voices are great except for laura's laura's kind of annoys me funnily enough but all the other voices are, are very good are done very well and I add a lot, especially like the little accents. Freddy's um, plot line is like, what happened in the bunker with this German man and then what happens after? And I think this is where she was trying to portray the horror of the war, but it, it, it just didn't quite hit with the sense of weight that I, and I think this is a relative thing. I really do think this is maybe just a relative thing. For me, I just never quite, it never quite hit as far as it could. Um, 
I felt it some, but the other problem I had, oh, Katie's returned from we don't know where. I was taking Sasha out too. And so I think the thing that me and Katie are going to maybe disagree on, which comes next, is that I fucking hated Freddy. Oh, I don't love Freddy, but I do like- He's so lame. I don't he's think so. so. He's not good at anything. He's not brave at all, which I understand. Oh, he is though. No, no, no. no, no. He's... The problem is, is we see him constantly as the damsel. And, but there's, I think she, okay, so to side with you, I think there were two, th two uh, character arcs that are missing in Freddy's storyline that we'll discuss. I'm not going to say Freddy's my favorite character in this, but I wasn't mad at Freddy. That's because I feel like, I feel like I know Fred Freddy. <laughs> um, you know, like I... I, the thing that made Freddy different for me and made him matter to me and made me care about his scenes was the beginning. I, I thought we needed more. And actually, I feel like we need this also with Laura. We needed more of the antebellum period before the war. Because the thing is, the war is an apocalypse to the lifestyle of the, Vic not the Victorians, whatever, the Edwardians? I don't know, whichever period came right beforehand. And so, like, we never get to see Freddy as the idealistic young guy going into war, thinking it's going to be noble, that there's going to be 10% casualties like it's been for the last 2,000 years, and instead there's, like, 50 to 90. The thing is, though, is I don't need that with him personally. The thing that gets me, and it did it for me, now, again, with the caveat that there are two scenes, I feel like, that are missing for his like just for him in general and they could have a, a a variety of different themes for either one of them that shows it or like an interaction that i wanted with that being set aside there are two big things that make me love freddie and i think she did a, i think i her choices to do that is what was successful for me um one is that when so obviously we get freddie when he is in the middle of, like will was saying of some pretty not great shit and he's taken a hit emotionally uh physically uh all, just a hit in general he got flipped over and was stuck in a pillbox uh for a while not a literal pillbox that's i guess what they call those that's areas. what they call a certain kind of bunker yeah civilians am i right guys she doesn't know the horror of war like you know the, the horror of world war one war I want to just talk, say for a minute that I think authors, and Arden does this a little bit, but I've seen it much worse with others, is that they channel their own teenage, like, oh, I'm against the world, nobody really understands me. Like, there's a certain amount of wish fulfillment in that, like, I'm a tough, rugged veteran who's just seen the harsh things in life that you soft people haven't. And I think sometimes authors push that wish fulfillment through veteran characters and, and soldiers in a way that isn't really real to life, because obviously PTSD is a problem. Um, soldiers do often come back with a very disconnected view of society that's actually from what i understand uh if through studies and stuff like that's actually one of the most difficult parts of ptsd is that they're suddenly moving from one environment into another they're moving from one that's very close and has a singular focus to a more disparate society that like doesn't really have those um but like have you ever felt because katie is married to a veteran she's part of the military industrial complex have you ever looked deep into juan's eyes and been like oh my god there's depths of darkness there that i can never understand well so two things to that have you ever gotten the sense that he's like a little like oh you're a soft woman who doesn't know hard times he doesn't make me feel that way because he knows how i grew up <laughs> like that's the thing is like real veterans don't really do that shit that much like it like they do it more in like republican like video ads it shows itself more like this it shows itself more like this self-derision of like a really bad situation and then being like yeah that sucked and so they kind of talk about it like it was a bad day like you know a bad day at work they talk about like oh listen to how dumb ask this bullshit is and it's like oh like you know my version of it is that i had a bad client come in and they were actually <laughs> like bipolar and one minute they were crying about their wife's cheating on them and the next they were like arguing prices or something like that you know like something wild like some dumb like interaction well that version and a lot of times it, the the more feeling of disconnection is more of like a oh, I don't feel good about myself. I feel like yeah. pathetic because I can't. Um, yeah. And again, this is, I am not a, a soldier. I don't, I never served. No, you're hitting it on the head for him. No, to be fair, I actually am a veteran because I pay, played airsoft once and I learned that air, it's not soft. It actually hurts a lot. And though actually, funnily enough, I do understand a little bit just from doing that in terms of like, it was for a bachelor party and um, A, I mostly just wanted to play Halo the whole time. But like, 
there were guys I went in there with in, in the bachelor party that like I didn't like, but right afterwards I did feel such a kinship of them of like, oh, we're brothers. So like, obviously it's not the same, but you can kind of extrapolate from that. But getting back to what I was saying is that um, I made the point once with Lee Bardugo that I kind of think her insecurity about not being poor shows up in her characters sort of being like, ugh. I'm so much better than these privileged other people. They don't know the harshness of the world. And I'm like, that's your own insecurity speaking as a poor person. That's not how I see the world, though, obviously eat the rich. Um, and I think sometimes it's people's own insecurity about not being like tough or proven that they channel through these military characters in a way that's not necessarily authentic to how the military characters themselves would feel or their experiences which one are you talking about are you talking about laura's attitude a little bit again arden doesn't do it a lot i'm really talking about it more as a trope oh, but like oh, there okay. are parts where like the doctor is like oh you can't do stuff and she's like you have no idea the things i've seen i think the way she played that hand was cheesy but i don't think the notion it's like i see what she was trying to do she was trying to show the gender discrepancy between her being a woman yes, and that's a man true. and blah 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 but I, yeah you're right it did come across as a little bit disingenuous yeah at times and you know people who are military um, veterans in our community uh sound off in the comments there are three things that i think she does smartly that makes me care about freddie in a way that i think is successful one is what I was starting to say before, which is his what he chooses to do for Vinta. Now, there's so for, as a side note, for a long time, I'm thinking to myself, why does he care so much about this guy that he went through? Like, like, why is he willing? Why is he willing to give up so much stuff for this guy? And I didn't believe it. Stop. I didn't believe <laughs> it at all. I didn't believe into it until we got one tiny itty bitty snippet at the end towards the end uh when we have the big climax between Fallon the devil and uh freddy and laura um so when we get that climax there's this one part that indicates a little bit more to their relationship and that fed me enough excuse to understand the like the trauma bonding the the beauty the uh like it, it sold it to me in the end so that I just want to say okay. that little piece that she throws in later is the only reason I bought into their relationship. I thought that was a very smart move on her point. And I don't know if she did that on purpose or it was on accident, but we can talk about that later. Um, but the second thing is, oh, no, no, I didn't even really say it. The point is, is I ended up liking Freddie. It's because he did seem clever and he seemed very selfless in the fact that he like it's it made sense to me that he kept pinning his motivation on Davinta because, hey, trauma. And so the back and forth and back and forth of them trying to survive together made sense for what would end up happening. And then later we'll talk about it and when we plot summarize. But he ends up standing up and helping Vinta in a way that I think is quite clever for the moment for him to come up with like it didn't win him any favors it didn't help him so it was kind of dumb but based off of the character that we get described by laura and some of the memories you get thrown every now and again that seems like freddie would do that so i'm okay with that um even though it's dumb i get it um i'm just barely able to be sold it but it works and so the second thing is is his love for laura in telling all of the memories that he says describes their relationship so well even though we don't get given a whole bunch of it we do get suffused with the love that he has for laura and laura has for him more than the love he has for laura because he, she's big sister so like it's very parental very motherly almost and so i really 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 love that i thought she did a great job for that and finally my last bit is that i think it was really smart of her to you were mentioning before like you know you haven't seen the horrors of what i've seen kind of vibe of soldiers and stuff or whatever right well freddie never actually you know what i like is that freddie never goes through that freddie's never like the horrors i have seen as in talking to someone or anything like that right he never brings it up instead we don't actually know what freddie has experienced all that much other than the flip over at the beginning of the story however when we have the big climax scene we have laura um spoilers we have laura opening doors and each of the doors are like they're different memories and a lot of the memories that we're given are things that freddie has lived through from laura's perspective that's pretty gnarly and sad and upsetting and i think arden misses the mark on getting that emotional horrificness 
of the body horror of those things. I just, she, unfortunately, she wasn't able to attain it. Even though there are some moments that are quite good, like there's a piece of brain on something that comes off at one point, liked that one. I, I liked the- The, the nurse is face. like, his brain came out, I put it in a pail, is that the right thing to do? <laughs> like, I know. so funny. Cause she's so freaked out, I love it. And then there's like another part where there's a guy, oh God, the only horror, well, the only horror part I actually felt horrific for for five seconds was the guy that blew his face off. And when he had the thing open, and then Fallon comes by and he's like, do, 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 and like, you know, doing the fiddler thing. And he gets up and he's like, I want to come with you. And I'm just like, oh, I love that. Was the only horror scene I liked in this. Again, I think Catherine Arden is actually very good at writing those kinds of things. Um, about the Freddy stuff, I'm going to rebut two of those things, but I'm going to do it later because it makes a little bit more sense later in the story. You need a little bit more context for why it didn't work for me. One thing I will say about Freddy is that, again, he, like you said, he is always in the damsel position, except for like two points. And the thing is, there is a, there is a part of being a human that's like a very ugly thing where like, we like we, we we get on the side of victims but if the victim stays weak too long we're identifying with the victim but they're being weak and that kind of disgusts us and, and 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 ourselves and so then we oh there's a specific term but we like externalize it to the victim and we actually start disliking them even more than we would have before um because we kind of relate to that a little bit and that's kind of what happened with freddie to me which is like i get he's having a realistic emotional depiction of a person in this situation at this time but it's still you don't like it he's he's so lame I get it. he's just like he's he never does anything cool he's always pathetic and it's like we never got to see him before this um i actually think i i think he would be such a stronger character if we weren't in mm -hmm. his head if we only saw like that palace of memories later in the story because we could be like oh we don't even understand the horrors that he's seen what do you mean though like as in from laura's perspective later oh my my thing is that halfway through the story this should start just stop following his point of view if not at the very beginning oh yeah no i would agree i think that 100 percent until the end and when we get vinta and his romance because you know she wanted the romance i know you don't like it but i don't care okay first of all uh, you're um uh, accusing me of a lot of uh homophobia which i do not agree with i love gay people first of all i did not accuse you of anything that's your hand showing second of all for those of you who aren't watching i'm obvious like he's making so many faces <laughs> i like to i like to rile katie and and marie up in this case um I actually think both of the romances in this book, even though I agree I really like the female, well, between Laura and the Doctor, I think is actually really well written and the best we've read. Um, but I actually think both of them should be cut because I think thematically they hurt the book, but we'll get to that later. God, no, I don't think Jones hurts the book. I think he only adds to it. I would, I, a, a good percentage of my interest in this book would have been lost if she didn't have that romance. You know, one thing I said about it is that when you're in love with somebody, or in lust, like it's basically like you're being drugged to act a certain way. And so it can make a genuine connection feel cheaper because it's being swayed by like, I wanna make kissy faces with the other person. And mm -hmm. I feel like I would have really liked if her and Jones is rom like everything's the same, but it's a little less explicitly romantic until the very end. And like, I think that would have strengthened the idea she had of there still being some hope in humanity. I know, I, I get it. I too liked their you're, romance. You're actually, uh I understand what you're coming at. Like, mm -hmm. I get what Will's saying, but honestly, it's so negligible. Yeah, it is pretty negligible. Now, his and Vinta's, there was, that's literally almost like too mechanical in nature in the plot line. It doesn't feel natural too much. It feels a yeah. little natural, but not enough. We'll talk about it more, but I think it, it she needed to be clear that he was gay way earlier than he, he she is. It was very obvious from the fucking get-go. Okay, all right. So basically, to break it down, what happened is in the bunker, him and Vinta, which is this German person who inexplicably speaks English. Wait, 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 wait. I want to explain real quick. Vinta was at university. I, I Vinta, know there's a reason. <laughs> Vinta, dad, who was a farmer, died and he inherited his land. Vinta went to go take care of all of the things from his father's death. And then that's when the war broke out. Vinta is 34. Uh, uh, Freddy is 23, 24, 22. He's 22. He's a ripe twink. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's everyone who's listening i'm sorry i made that noise but that's the face i was making because i was like hmm. but also like daddy vinta like the bait like 
Vinta's there for Freddy. I love Vinta. I actually originally early on, I was like, oh, him and Laura, that could be kind of interesting. But then that like didn't really actually play out. And I do like Jones. Basically what happens is Freddy is in this fallen bunker. It's all dark with Vinta. The book really tries to sell how horrific it is. I didn't feel it. There's a corpse in there with them. And it just didn't really feel like there was a corpse in there though. It didn't. And also you just can't get a sense for the darkness. Like, I, I think the problem is that she was... She those horror elements really need to be added up um, over time and and through the growing horror. Me and Katie do um, critiques of prose for our parasocial darlings on our Patreon. You guys should go join. Um, and for a while now, people have been wanting us to do an action scene. And I keep looking for the good action scenes that we've read because we have read some good one. Yes, but I also want to do this scene where they're in the pill box together because there is a reason why it's not horrific. And I want to pinpoint the technical reasons why it's not. No, actually, that is a very good point. We should do that for next week because I wasn't sure what we were going to do for next week anyway. Pretend I did. And the thing is, I've never been able to find an action scene that's good to look at because all of the good action scenes, once I look at them in isolation, they're not as good. What what really makes them good is all of the build up to it. Um, there's a book called Sabriel where like the last four chapters are building up to one fight that lasts like four or five pages, but it's so intense. And so I think she didn't really have time to build that horror because it happens so quickly. We don't get Freddy alone in the bunker for a long time. It's just like immediately like, Vinta is there and he talks like this. And he is like, I have a small farm in the countryside. I would, I would argue that's not required in general for her to accomplish horror in the scene. However, that being said, that could have aided her in that. I don't think you need the buildup. I think there's a way to acquire it instantly if you do the right approach. I mean, you may be right. I Again, I can't quite put my finger on it, so it would be an interesting scene to go through um, to figure out exactly why it doesn't quite hit as hard as yeah. it should. And for some people, it will hit hard. Like, different people have different- Oh yeah, for sure. But no, there's too much stuff I've watched. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of the thing is it's it's difficult to create a context. It takes time to create a context to understand why something would be horrific in a subjective state versus whatever you've seen on the internet. Yeah. Him and Vinta are in the dark and they're like, oh, we're the only things left. They're like the world, you're a German and I am an American. Or not an American, a Canadian, a Canuck. And, um, you know, the war is out there. We don't know what's going on in here. I don't know why I'm pronouncing it like I'm Venter. Um, and I was like, oh, cool. This is like Amnesia, the bunker. This is going to be yeah. awesome. It's kind of, again, it's not, it's not bad. It was like, okay, hold on one second. If you were expecting that, no wonder you're let down. Because that would have been sick as fuck if they were dealing with Fallon in underground sewers or something like that. Yeah, and they're like, not sure okay. if it's like a hallucination or not. So, so, that's a different book. William. That would have been dope though. What if like they keep going and they're like, where are these tunnels leading? What are even are they? And they feel the heaving sides of them, like the inside and of the stomach. And they went to hell basically, and they're in hell. Yeah, no, William, that's a fun horror book. That's not what Catherine Arden probably wanted to do. However, that being said, yes, that would be an amazing story. Yeah. I would have loved Laura atop the world, them in the, the pits of evil. However, uh, th that's not what this book is. Now I want to write a fan fiction. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. We should totally do it. Um, it's a monster boyfriend where the monster from Amnesia the Bunker and um, Freddy get together. It's like a crossover in AU. Wait, isn't it a giant rat? That would be so funny. <laughs> I mean, we can actually. Freddy, <laughs> what, it, isn't it a rat boyfriend. creature? It's like a, it's a human who turned into like a rat type, type beast. His beady eyes looked into Freddy's. He couldn't help but see the cute little whiskers twitch in the low light. He wondered to himself what those little rat lips might feel like against his. The pearly gleam of his slavering jaws. Freddy could not help but imagine what those might feel. Against his. Oh, I was gonna say closed around his most private of areas, but fine, Katie, <laughs> you who have read so much more slash fic than I have, I guess that's the accurate. No, the, no, my mom was gonna be watching this. We need to keep this a, no, no, no. We need the to keep this a Christian, the a Christian podcast. Nestled just gently little whiskers tickling the inside of his yeah no you got a picture you got to think about the sensory details um all right we're i'm gonna be blanking out some of that um but anyway keep all of it for the patrons yes so they're like bonding under the bunker and eventually they get out right um and so this is the part that i kind of wanted to talk about a little bit because the two of them are portrayed as being like oh my gosh we're one flesh now that we survived the bunker i didn't believe it here's the thing 
Freddy is gay. And you don't figure this out till the very end of the book. And so the whole time I was like, okay, this is, everyone. No, no, no. My, my whole time I was like, this is kind of gay, guys. And then I was like, no, no, no. Men showing intimacy and emotional connection between each other is not inherently gay. That is a construct of toxic masculinity. I'm not going to put that on the book. She was just trying to show the human warmth and connection. No, there are two specific words she uses at two points at the beginning where I'm like, she's building up for them to have a basically a to I mean it is a toxic romance uh in its own way it's a traumatic a trauma built romance it's dark but i wouldn't say that they're toxic to each other no i don't mean they're toxic to each other what i mean is it's it is not a health fine unhealthy it is an unhealthy trauma bonded relationship that may or may not last beyond them getting therapy if they ever find it however that being said they're probably never going to find it based off of the way it's described at the end and honestly freddie's better for having it and, and the thing about it is that the book past this point will act like they have this incredible bond that they're willing yeah, to go against their own it. countries for. I don't buy it either. I don't buy it at all. And in retrospect, it kind of makes sense if he's gay, it's a repressed thing, so he can't even really f notice why he is so drawn to this handsome German man with uh, an accent that is uh, very attractive. So I didn't buy it until, and even then, I it's too weak for me to find it well done it's not well done but i barely bought it because of what i mentioned before um when laura is opening these doors of memories that i mentioned earlier she opens one to pure darkness and it's like the end of the world and then she hears voices and she hears vinta's voice and she hears freddie's voice discussing and they're quoting poetry back and forth to each other and so like i can see no 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 no, no. but i can see how the gentle cadence of that and the reliance upon that would build a romantic notion if you are already predisposed to that and how that would make you fall. I mean, I would certainly fall in love with who I perceive to be the person who was there for me when no one else could be. Like, is that a real love? Who knows, debatable, but it is a certain kind of love. So I think two things. One, I think that would seem would be so much more powerful just from her point of view. Because you wouldn't, well, the thing is, we got to see that scene in person from Freddie's point of view, and it wasn't as powerful. We didn't get the same scene. They're, they're quoting poetry at each other. I don't remember them quoting the words. They, that's the difference, though. I knew okay. that they quoted poetry to each other. Now, granted, if they cut the poetry interaction scene at the beginning and then had it at the end, it would be more powerful, I would agree. Just with what's happening, it just wasn't the right choice, unfortunately, for me, personally, and I think objectively, I think she, she, it, it just was not, that was not viable. That was the least viable thing. It just, it, it's not enough for what Freddy goes through in terms of yeah. like, because once they get out of the bunker, he is like, all Vinta, I have, I have pledged to my life. And so like- Well, it's because he thinks his sister's dead. Okay, so wait, let's continue. Let's continue. Well, that's what I'm saying is that, okay, so, so he gets out of the bunker with Vinta. They're in no man's land. They decide to go to the allied side. Um, they get that's attacked. That's where they're closer at too because they don't know where right. they're at but there's this whole thing where they're like okay but the other person might die if we go to their side but he's like yes i could not even conceive of leaving vinta he had been there in the in the dark and i'm like i i did not feel that I from the scene that. that you put i, I get it conceptually but yeah, i didn't but not feel it in wise. my no, gut you're right you're right so logically it makes sense but i did not feel it come through yeah exactly like and the thing is it only really makes sense if in the past if in retrospect you're like oh he was gay for Vinta. But then that also kind of cheapens it. That the, the whole idea is that they had this connection as two soldiers in this system. And they recognize the humanity in each other and the inhumanity of the system. The thing about oh, it is in... I see yeah. what you're saying about it. So I did, initially I wanted to argue on the cheapens it argument. But when you mentioned the system specifically, I get what you mean by that. Because that is a massive theme in this book. And I just want to be clear that when I... I, I'm not just saying this because they're gay. I actually kind of feel this about a lot of romance after having read a lot of this. Again, I think um, there's a part later with Laura and jo jo Josh where, like, again, I like Katie. I really like the romance and it's cute and it's well written. But, like, I do feel like it, it cheapens a little bit the whole idea that he represents humanity's hope for her. I understand where you're coming from it, but I can also see where Arden was coming from it for this. And I think it's fine. I think it's barely fine. But I think it's fine. That The reason I say this is because to portray... The thing is, is it wasn't a carnal romance. It was an emotional romance. And it was like a mental reliance. So I think it still does that job. 
and it checks that box. So since it's not carnal in nature, I think it doesn't cheapen it as much as it would have if we had been given those kinds of scenes. I think that's fair. I mean, I do think that's pretty fair. Again, Ar Arden is very good at her craft. But just to point out, I think in general that can happen. And I think especially yes, it's romance, not, yeah. not yeah. so much in this book, but especially in a bunch of other books. Again, the whole time I'm telling myself, no, they're not gay. You're being toxically masculine for being like, they're gay. No, they were gay. I, that was, You're right. But but then I'm like, but then this makes no sense why he's so devoted. So there's a part in um, Dan Carlin's Blueprints for Armageddon, that, ten, that 11 hour podcast I was talking about. While you're saying this, I'm going to go get more water. Okay, water, guys. Not She's getting water. She's not... Water's not leaving her, to be clear. No, well, that wouldn't no, be water. I that'd see, be urine. I, there's a part where y you really get a sense for like, um, so there's like the very famous, like you have um, the Christmas Day truce where some of the two sides would like exchange gifts. And there was a sense of like um, them coming together again, understanding that this is not a war between each other. This is a war between powers that they are pawns in. And you really feel that. You really feel this sense of like, why didn't they just combine and overthrow their own governments? Like, why why didn't that happen? Like, you are feeling that when you're re when you're listening to it. Or at least I was as a socialist, um, and that didn't really happen here. I didn't feel it as much. Again, for some reason, that podcast is much more effective at pushing through the themes that Arden wants to do in a non-narrative format than the more narrative of the book. And uh, again, I think it was just kind of rushed into. Um, and again, it just, it doesn't make sense that he would, Freddie would so quickly be all on Vinter's side because they go back to his side and he realizes, oh, Vinter is, um, I was gonna say damaged, is wounded. So, oh, uh, if he goes to a prison of war camp, they're not gonna, he, he's gonna die. They won't heal him. I gotta do something about this. He was there with me in the dark. I cannot conceive of not doing, of not being in the dark with him. Um, and like, you're like, okay, calm down. And so like, again, I'm just going to say throughout, I just didn't work for me. But anyway, he's like, okay, I could take him to see my sister because my sister's a doctor and she'll help me. And so they go through the lines and like, he goes to find his sister, but this is the point where his sister had gotten hit by a shell and like, isn't there. And then we'll come back to his plot line in a little bit. This whole time, because this is about halfway through the book, we get to this point. This whole time, Laura has been like, she, she, again, she, the ship exploded in Halifax which I'm assuming is a real thing that happened. And like her parents are now dead and she lives with three old ladies who are kind of cool, but aren't on screen enough. I know, bro. <laughs> they felt like really important people. Yeah, I thought they were going to be like from, you didn't read it, but the Raven Boys had three eccentric ladies too that were a lot of fun. Um, and uh, they do like seances and she comes home and they're doing a seance with a character called Penelope something or Pim. And she will be in the book as a whole. She's really cool. She had a son who died. Um, and she is very much of the like Victorian Edwardian era. Um, she's not, she's also described as super pretty, which I just, I liked as a touch. I thought that was cute for some reason. Yeah, no, I like, uh, like I liked Pim. Honestly, Pim's one of my favorite characters in this novel. I love what she does in the end. I love her conviction. I love how, ain I love the, so I want to say it now so that way I don't forget because I feel like this is something I'll forget because I didn't even think about it till now. I loved him so much because she was portrayed a very specific way that I liked. And then she went crazy. I felt like that was a little tenuous, but we'll we'll get to it when we get to it. Again, she's one of my, I really liked her as a character and I really liked her and Laura's relationship because what happens is that like Laura get, like stumbles in on them while they're doing the seance for Pim's dead son. And then the two of them kind of like bond um laura's very sort of prickly because you know she has to she's a veteran and um she then gets um a package with freddie's clothes and his dog tags but it's weird because there's two of them um and usually you would leave one with the body and so and the, and like and nobody will give her a straight answer of what happened to him like is he mia is he dead like wh what's going on there and she's like i know he's dead but i can't, i need to know what happened and how it happened and so there's this other lady called mary who runs a hospital mary is like this cool independent doctor lady um and she's fun she's kind of a fun character she's like the more laura but more um and she's like hey you could come work for me you know and Laura's like, no, I'm out of the game. And then she's like, I got to search for my brother. So she decides to go with Mary. But, you know, okay. So this is a good transition. So I found originally, so there's a lot of uh, things that we read slash that you watch and stuff where there's this trope where it's like, I got to find out what happened to this person. And it's not really believable to see that person give up everything 
to go after this one crazy lead of a story. But this makes sense. It's because Laura's honestly still going through some trauma. And Laura just lost both her parents in a very traumatic accident, just came home from the war from a very traumatic accident, and her only family left is Freddy. So it does make a lot of sense for Laura and her character archetype to go after to go see where her brother is. Yeah, completely. It's a it's a believable motivation. You are kind of... Yeah. Again, I liked Laura. Laura's fun. She's not my favorite character, but she's she's fun. Um, and the other thing is that Pim decides to come with them, and, you're like, and Laura's like, you don't know what it's like. Man, I have scarred hands from like that was not... the cheesiest part that was the cheesiest part for me is when she spoke to pim She's like deep on hands like this and pim's like oh, i gotta do it i gotta see what my son was like and well was... pim's also way more badass than laura in a lot of ways <laughs> pim's like bitch please um no there's only actually one part that i mean that's not true laura's a great character but there's not a lot of moments where you're like i love laura i love Laura in one scene in particular. I liked any time she was bantering with the soldiers on the front line, and she had such an easy way of falling into their lingo that I just thought was really funny. Dude, the st the raunchy story she tells yeah, in front of funny. everyone, the way her, even the way the voice, uh, the the narrator's voice changes, where it's like it suddenly becomes a talk show voice. I uh -huh. really liked that. I really liked that. So the narrator. So first of all, audiobook. Mwah. Um, although I will argue that Freddie's voice is annoying because he always talks like this. And then it always begins like this, and then it ends like this. Oh, I don't want and then to it time. always does this, and then it ends like this. That is one thing that actually really bothered me. It's weird, but the main characters have the worst voices. Vinter has a great voice. Uh, Fallon, Fallon has a wonderful voice. Like, it adds so much. And it's like, Freddy is just kind of... Even, even uh, Dr. Jones, Stephen has a great oh voice. yeah he has a really good voice too it, it does a lot to, to um, it, it gave me very much character. like a uh, sherlock Holmes vibe or like you know all those characters Benedict that have, like, cumberpatch the, yes yes it gave me those vibes <laughs> so hardcore the one thing that i really really liked was that uh we'll, t we'll talk about when we get there i'm just gonna allude to it now but she later on faces something and when she faces it and she finally decides to trust her gut it's just so refreshing to have a character be like do it do it yeah you know like it, they just do it yeah she's very proactive as a character too which is very nice after so many reactive characters she really drives the plot which is nice oh god it's so great so they set off across the atlantic um then they get to england and they get to france and on the way um they meet some generals and it's like, oh, look at these general pigs dining in Victorian houses while men die on the front lines. While they all salivate over Pim because she's like a beautiful elegance of the old world. <laughs> I love that. I just, I really like that. Again, because Pim has to be 40 if her kid was in the war and died. And so I just yeah. really like that she's like this older lady who's super pretty. And Laura is kind of met, but like they're friends. And I don't know why. I just always find that female relationship of like the hot friend and not the not hot friend really cute. Pim? And Laura had hard lesbo vibes for a hard second. Again, emotional intimacy between people is not necessarily gay, and it's it's harmful to think so. But I would write fan fiction. Yeah, I would too, actually. Um, so the thing is, is there were some moments, especially towards the beginning of their relationship, where Pim was obviously salivating for Laura's like friendship, and that can almost be like that is pining. Uh, so, but I just recognized the pining and was like, oh, that's a little gay. Um, but uh, but. No, what I was going to say, though, was that um, Pip, uh, the mirror, before I forget, because I don't want to forget, you know, in Fallon's place, what does the mirror represent? Uh, I don't think it represents anything. I think it actually, you just literally see what you want. That's um, it. There's no, like, that's not a symbol from I don't war. think it's a symbol. So we'll talk. So so what happens is, again, there's this theme of like, oh, the generals are pigs, whatever. And then on the way to the front, they get hit by an artillery shell, I think, and their driver dies. And so they have to walk in the mud and they find a chateau. Not a chateau. Mm -hmm. The chateau is where the hospital is my love uh it's a hotel they find a hotel and they're like and they're like oh it looks like shit from the outside but at the very least when we go in it'll be dry and they go in and it's like <laughs> i thought of it as the scene in the shining where it's like oh wow it's so pretty that's exactly what i pictured was kind of like the uh you know like any of those ghost hotel stories where it's like the shining elegance but like underneath is like this layer of despair yeah, you're like oh interesting and they see a man playing a violin beautifully and this man is the proprietor of the hotel and his name is Fallon. and he has one eye that's bright and one that's dark and there's almost as though there's a glitter to it and the narrator does a very good like 
Belgian French accent for him that I really like. Yeah, I did too. Um, also, as a side note, up till this point, I was not sure. And it is not made sure whether or not there's any magic in this book. And so what happens here, because I'll talk about this right now, but basically what happens is he says there's a mirror that um, if you look into it, you'll see the thing you want most in your heart. Um, so like the Harry Potter mirror. And then um, the next day they wake up and like the hotel is empty and it's broken. And how could there ever have been a party there? And there were so many people. Wait, sir. During this thing also, while it happens, that like they're like, oh, it's warm. It's happy. There's a whole bunch of army people here everywhere. Army dudes everywhere. And they're all listening to the dude play the violin. And they all get drunk. And Pim looks into the mirror at some point and screams bloody horror and all you know is that something red was in the reflection so blood obviously um and then uh that at, when she goes when laura goes to go to comfort pim she sees freddie in the crowd and is like oh my god it's my brother and then goes to go chase after him and fallon comes up to her and is like oh no no it's certainly if your brother was here wouldn't he come to you and then oh. she was like, oh, you're right. Yeah, I just hallucinated. Then she passed out and woke up in the morning. And that's where right. we are. And so, and they're basically like, okay, that was weird. We got to keep moving. Um, and so the thing about it is this whole book, I was waiting to see how the horror of World War I and the speculative Fantastic. fantasy element were going to match up, right? Because that's always the, the crux is that usually the, um, when you're doing like historical fiction in this way uh, with like, uh, you know whatever the the magical element is like a metaphor or a way of enhancing what's going on um, one review i once read of pan's labyrinth is that in the normal way these kinds of books work which is pan's labyrinth for those who don't know is about a girl meeting a whole bunch of really cool practical effects monsters while her stepfather is a fascist who's super violent in spain and they said the way the, those kind of books work in a neil gaiman sense is that usually the um supernatural world takes precedence and kind of lashes out at the normal problems they're dealing with in the mundane world and the way that it works in pan's labyrinth isn't like that like she goes into the magical thing and the real monster is the fascist um who sews up his own thing his own cheek at one point which isn't relevant but i thought it was cool this whole time i was like okay how is she going to tie in this supernatural element to the themes of what she's saying about world war one and also the whole time i was like is it going to just be ghosts? That's going to be kind of lame. I also thought it might be kind of lame because I thought the metaphor was going to be too obvious uh, because that's something people do. I went into this book. I didn't read the summary, Will. Really? You and me I didn't never know do what that. This, I, for most of the books you give me, I don't read the summary for. I just go in like Blind. raw dog in it. I, I did the same with this one. So I had no idea, but I knew everyone that the last book we had read of hers had magic in it, but in a certain kind of way. So I was like, oh, is that going to come up? And I have to say, like, I think it's fine pacing wise for the most part, but it, it barely saved itself in the end because the point in which the magic comes in is almost, uh, almost, almost too far into the story for it to like match up with the themes. I actually think it doesn't really... I only understand what was going on with the speculative element, or not speculative, right? The magical element of it because I read the the afternote where she explains what she was trying to do with it. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting, but that's not what you achieved in the book. To me, it felt very like not quite, it didn't, it didn't tie into the thing. Again, I think part of the problem is this book doesn't quite have a thesis statement. So that speculative element can't quite tie into it. You know what's funny? Okay, so I feel like now's a really good time based mm -hmm. on what you just shared with us. Um, so without reading the afterword, without reading a summary, without having anything but the story itself, and that's it, I thought that this was all coming. Bear with me. Like I, I didn't think it was purely this. Obviously, it was a, it was a like depiction of World War One and all that shit. But I thought at the very heart of it, it was a story about somebody losing somebody to depression or, or PTSD, and that it was literally just like Freddie's loss of himself was a literal metaphor for the loss that he would have had through PTSD and going through like depression and losing himself in the war. And th the whole Fallon thing was literally a like, I mean, it wasn't in the story, but beyond the story, it was a metaphor that represented the loss of a loved one through the loss of what happens through the loss of identity and self through the war. And that's what the story was. I actually think that's a very good reading. I think that makes sense. I think that doesn't quite work in certain ways, or it, it at least is a little too obvious at times that that's a metaphor. The thing is, though, it's not like a like a like a like a classic literature piece where it touches on that. It's definitely at its heart 
a fu- like I want to tell a story that's like doesn't isn't perfect like that. I guess you know what I mean. No, I get what you're saying. Um, so not to be one of those people who's always like, and in my book, blah 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 blah, because those people are annoying. But but me and Katie started writing a magical realism kind of story, very Neil oh, yeah, Gaiman esque. Right. Um, that's about like both the grunge of the world and the supernatural element. And something in it is I did I just I really wanted to avoid this as a metaphor for this other thing where it fits in clumsily. And the way we ended yeah. up talking it through, we found a way that I thought was very elegant. And I feel like this doesn't quite have that elegance because again, we'll talk You're more right. about Fallon as we go. Um. But like, that's the thing that I just don't, I think, I think it's an interesting story in its own right, but I don't necessarily think it plays into World War One because World War One is such a hardcore setting. Um, and that's what it's kind of trying to do. So basically they get to the hospital. There's this like very like, oh, I'm proper and like no nonsense uh, doctor there called Josh. His name is not Josh. His name is Stephen Jones, Dr. Jones. And Dr. Jones is literally every character on the spectrum that you've seen that's like actually a, like a super genius from a movie that's like he fought like he's actually a really cool, like he's the cool, dark, brooding, badass anime character dude. So like, but like very, but but without the like dumb saccharine portrayal of it, instead he's just like no nonsense, normal, logical. And it's so great to have a male lead like that. He's not bitchy hot boy. I loved no, it I love so it. much that he's not, even though he is a little high strung at times or whatever, but like- He's yeah, but he's normal. This is such a nice low key romance of people connecting in a way that's genuine oh. between him and Laura and like oh. a little bit, like a little prickly here mm, and there. And mm, I was like, mm, God, mm, mm, what? Mm. maybe women can write romance. Maybe we'll allow that still. <laughs> so I've said it many times and I'll say it again. Feminism and uh, not shaming women for their libidos was a mistake. It led to things like Akatar. We should roll it back. Uh, I am now on Tucker Carlson's side. But no, but like this really was just, it was so nice to read this after so many bitchy boy romances that aren't, yeah. don't really have a real connection and rely on fever touch and like things like that. Yeah. And so like in the hospital, there's cool things too, where she's like shocked that he can use like- He's doing blood transfusions. He recognized that he had typo blood and he was like, okay, well, I've done, I've read this research in this place that if you do this, you can keep blood and it keeps. And so like, I like that too. He's a, he's a little unethical, but not really. He's just unethical enough for him to try to save people. Yeah, and there's a lot of really cool little details. Like um, at one point there, um, there's a soldier who tried to commit suicide that she notices oh, that God. he has not put into surgery, even though to save his life, he should have. And the thing about it is that if he, you know, they, if he goes into surgery and he lives, they're going to execute him anyway. And so he hasn't done that because he, the, he'll just let him die without having to go through the whole being executed thing. And like, and I think that's such a, it's such a nice little detail and it really tells you about the world. Um, there's a movie that, oh, I don't remember what it is, but it, it's really harrowing to watch about these three men in World War One who get chosen as scapegoats for some assault that doesn't work. And it's like about their trial and execution. And it's so stark and chilling. And this book doesn't quite hit that. Again, it has really nice details for World War One as a setting in the background. It's too soft for that. I think that's the thing. I think is World War One in the background. I'm like, oh my god, this is a fantastic setting. This is so much better than Divine Rivals. Divine Rivals can go eat a giant pile of shit. But as the focus of the themes of the story, I don't think it quite hits hard enough. What's really nice though is the scene that happens right after Laura discovers that this guy that attempted suicide is still alive and not in surgery and everything and that he's just slowly waiting away what i like also as an additional characterization moment on both their parts is that jones takes her side and is like i want to i want a one-on-one -on -one with you right now after she brings up the surgery bit and he's like so i want to make sure we're on the same page with each other and i like how forward he is like that like he's kind of aggressive and he's just like i want to make sure we're on the same page and we understand one another what's happening and even better, Laura's like, holy shit, yeah, you get the politics. And he's like, yeah, I fucking get the politics. Do you get the politics? And she's like, yeah, I get the politics. And so they're just <laughs> like, yeah, like I, we're on the same page. And I love that trust. It is so nice. Well, and understand it. They under, and, and like that mental connection is what is missing in so much of the books I we've know. read. Like they philosophically believe in the same things as one another, which we honestly don't get a lot because we get the opposites attract thing, which doesn't actually work in real life most times. Well, and also like we see them growing to respect each other in, yeah. in concrete ways that like 
is skipped over by so many enemies to lover books or even like divine rivals where they like respect each other afterwards and you're like but wait why like what and then basically on her days off she learns how to ride a motorcycle and goes searching for her brother at the same time pim wants to search for fallon because there's a rumor on the front about this fiddler whose hotel you can only go to once and all the men are like oh i wish i could go back to that and you get the sense that pim probably saw her son in in the mirror and that's why she wants to no, go back i knew it was not her son as soon as she screamed and she and like the, there was a description of of something that laura thought she saw reflected in the mirror and i was like so she's killing someone so i thought it was one of two things i either thought that she was i this was my funny side and I was like, either she's actually a lesbian and she loves Laura and there's like some wildly intense sex scene happening in that mirror or she's <laughs> so or funny. she's killing someone or she's killing someone and she doesn't want to believe it, but she wants to kill someone. And that was built up from before. And the only reason I thought that was because prior to this moment, they went to that party with the generals and when they went to the party. Pim gets pulled aside by this one general who was in charge of her son's, uh, like, it, it, there's a connection between her son and this general guy. And it's very obvious that something disquieted her and upset her during that interaction. So you're like, okay, so he knew something about her son. So, like, I thought right away, she wants to kill someone. She This is a tale of madness for her. I didn't realize how far and intense it would go because, man, Arden knocked it out of the park with Pim, in my opinion. That's cool. I didn't I didn't read that as much into it um, at that point. I, I really did think it was like, oh, it's probably just like her son or whatever. Um, or in the, at the very least, I think the book wants you to think that. We go back to Freddy and um, Vinta, mm -hmm. or Vinter and his Twinks adventure, as I call it. Um, and I don't call it that. I just thought it was funny. And what happens is that they, Laura isn't at the hospital they went to. But like he meets one of Laura's friends and he's like, OK, I want everyone to keep in mind uh, what we premised with before. This is there's a time lag here. So during this time that we're getting of uh, uh, I keep wanting to say Jimmy, um, Freddy. uh, Freddie's perspective, this is when Laura has just been sent home for the attack earlier before her parents even died. Um, so that's where we're at. And the thing is, at this point, I didn't like Freddie's plotline because I kept being like, can we get back to Laura? I'm not really that interested in what's happening to him. That's usually me. I thought it kind of ruined. I really do think it kind of ruined the the mystery a little bit. It seems like it would be such a more interesting tension to keep of like, what is going on here versus like, we know what's happening with him. Um, but I still thought like, OK, it's fine at this point. So basically he gives Vinter his clothes and his identity tags, or not his clothes, his jacket and his identity tags, and tells um, the friend of Laura, hey, this guy, he said something about Freddy. That's uh, Freddy Ivan. And she's like, oh, I got to save this German guy for my friend so that Laura can eventually figure out what happened to her I her really brother. like that Freddy did that. So the oh, fact I think it's Freddy... very clever. I think it's very oh, clever. I think it was such great. Per and so that little itty bitty bit gives me just enough nom noms to be like, I believe in him. I believe in his character and the authenticity of it, but it's not enough to make me savor it. And it's also it's halfway through the book. Up until this point, he's no, just it's been. Not. This is like one. This is like one third through the book. Uh, it's closer to half, I think, from where it I was. It is not closer to half. Uh, you didn't finish the book, so your view of it is a little skewed. I didn't finish the last right. five minutes of them making out, apparently. <laughs> right, and so and he kind of fades back because he's like, okay, but what can I do? I can't rejoin the military because I'll be a deserter. And he also murdered another Canadian guy in the trenches by accident uh, not that anyone kind of. would know nobody yeah, knows that was that. weird like you just don't tell anybody you weirdo yeah like that's the one thing that also i didn't buy the authenticity of she he can just lie why does he have to say anything <laughs> he can be like yo so this german peasant man saved my life and i am now okay he is not part of the german nazi army He's actually, or not, They're not Nazi. nurses. Uh, I was going to yeah, say yeah, it's yeah, yeah, for yeah. the Kaiser. Point is, is I'm, he is not the enemy. He's just a civilian. Like, I didn't understand why that couldn't have happened. So I was a little like, eh, about that. But what happens is, is Fallon comes up next to him and is like, so, bro, want to come with me? Want to come into my magical realm of mysteries? And uh, he, Freddy's like, I guess. I don't know where the fuck else to go, which I would too. It's because, hell, it's magic. Like, that's like to escape the horrors of the world. So that makes sense, I guess. So he goes off with Fallon, and then Fallon slowly but surely gets a super hard on for Freddy's memories and wants to steal a num 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 on them and make them into music. <laughs> okay, you're skipping past a few things, but yes, that's essentially what we realize is Fallon is like, 
You must tell me a story every evening. That you want to stay with me. That you want to stay with me. And, and Freddy's like, okay, weirdo. And so he tells him a story, but then the next day he realizes he, he can't remember the stories anymore. And Fallon's like, ha ha, I am the fiddle. I, I sing your memories. And I was like, that's a really lame power, dude. <laughs> like, and that's the other thing is that the reveal that like all the devil is doing is like, eating stories and regurgitating them in song form okay. was not that cool. I thought it was really lame. You know, no, that is not what's happening <laughs> it's there. It's pretty first lame. Of all. No, it's more deep than that. And yes, no, he is not some great, horrible devil creature. However, that being said, he is pretty hor- The thing is, is he's like what I would imagine the devil to be. Not a great tempter. Uh, oh, not a great, uh, not a great uh, the destroyer, but a great tempter. Somebody who like offers something and slowly steals out of the other hand so that's like the vibe i got from it at least in this incarnation of this like version of the devil and the thing is is fallon doesn't just take your memories in each of the memories that like freddie contemplates this later and i don't think this was contemplated enough for it to really make a big enough impact for uh i think it should have but freddie contemplates this twice in for 0 0.5 seconds of the fact that wait if i gave that memory away that means my identity is gone because that memory is no longer building up my personality and that comes up twice uh, but it doesn't come up long enough or in a way that's meaningful enough in the way it's presented that i felt that loss as much as i feel like i should have so the problem with that is that i don't think that's portrayed well but the essence of it of that fallon consumes your memories and wants to consume you heart and soul so that way you become a shade of your prior self so that way he can uh he almost like he he minimizes what you were into a simple theme that's what i got from it the problem is is that fallon takes everything that you are as a human and makes a story out of it in his music but that could never encompass the the complexities and depths it's because freddie brings this up at one point he's like this song isn't me the song is a feeling i felt in one moment this is a this is a snap shot of me in a moment this isn't me freddie so that's an absolutely fascinating idea that i don't think is borne out by the book and i want to read that book now of 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 narrativizing somebody's life and flattening it because i think no. it's actually supposed yeah. to be more of a metaphor for oh there are things he doesn't want to remember and those are uh, you know, I'm running from my PTSD. See, the problem is, is she mixes both those themes because that actively comes up in Freddie's narrative. Like, n Freddie actively says, oh no, this is happening. And there's this one part where um, we haven't gotten to it yet on either timelines, but uh, Fallon drags Freddie along and plays Freddie's memories of this horrid night in, uh, uh, for all these old veterans to hear. And they all freak out because the the melody is Freddie's pure, unadulterated fear of the 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 horrific night he had, and uh, during the war. And Freddie thinks to himself, "Oh my God, this is just pure madness. This isn't even who I am now or who I was during that moment. It's just the fear and the anger." And so I, I she does it, but she doesn't do it effectively. Yeah, it just and again. It's a lame power. <laughs> like, it's just not interesting or twisted. No, it's not. It's not interesting or twisted, which makes it horrible. It's a slow siphoning of who you are. It's just, it's like an old vampire. It's not like a fun, cool vampire that does cool things. It's something that is so pathetic and small. And I think it's supposed to be that way, too. He's a leech. He's a parasite. So one of the things um uh, uh, she said in the afterword is that she was really kind of interested in the idea of what would the old world devil do in such a man-made hell? She didn't phrase it like that, but I phrased it like that because I think that's a really interesting inversion of how you should say that. Also, I realized Catherine Arden writes much prettier than she talks because her words sound weirdly. Like when other when the narrator can make like song like music out of them, and then when she reads them, you're like, wow, you don't have a very good reading voice compared to your writing style. But anyway, that's a, that's an aside. And like that is a fascinating idea of like this um, sort of personal judgment and hell view of Christianity. How would that devil handle? the scale of destruction unleashed by man and not just the scale of it, but the impersonality of it. There's no sin or uh, vice or virtue, sin, vice or virtue. That, that's man. I'm a wordsmith today. There's just these systems in place of grinding machines, um, which the off again, every once in a while, 
Laura, and by everyone's wrong, I mean like twice in the book, she's like, oh, it was the system that was so complex and uh, terrifying. And I'm like, again, you're not really showing that in the actual text of the book. That does not actually come up. That is told you by the characters from the author. So that, no, that while you get the gist of that, that is not an actual theme in the book. I just really like the idea of as a person, yeah, how would the devil handle that? Like, how would he even understand it? And he wouldn't just take people's memories to sing a dumb song. So, so Catherine Arden's version of the old world devil is not my version of an old world devil. And I think that's very subjective. So, or, or unless you're going legit verbatim the Bible or some shit like that. I like her version of this devil because it reminds me of you know um the uh he's very pied piper-esque no i actually do like this incarnation of him as a fey creature but to pose the question of what is this old world creature like in the new world it's not that it's like well well no no but you got it, like it's just different it's different the thing is is when i think of i don't know look this is this is super subjective everyone this is not objective my version of the devil is just just a tiny bit different but the thing is is i can't help but say i also agree with arden's version of the devil because i or of this version of it it's because it's kind of this like he's not really that strong he's not really that controlling he just preys upon the weak and so that is doing that in this so it is successful in that way and i think that's sort of an interesting interpretation of the devil as in this new world, all he is is a leech. But that's not really shown. Again, I think there's something to the idea of personal sin versus impersonal destruction. So there, so it, it, you could get tie into themes of like, okay, maybe I am a good person or not, but it actually just doesn't really matter. Like the devil's trying to tempt me with all this like personal shit, but that's not what's important right now. He is pathetic before the the horror of an artillery barrage um, that will just flatten the landscape. Well, that's what Laura says. Yeah, but the thing is, it just doesn't really feel that way. Again, the devil, like the thing is, there's no reason to fear the devil bef in the old world either. You're just like, go play your song, your, your gay ass song somewhere else. I mean that in an early 2000s gay ass song kind of way. Well, the thing is, is like, I don't think he, the problem is, is, you're right, he's missing a certain edge, but not the edge of like, oh, I'm a maniacal evil devil that I'm going to like rend the flesh from your bones. Like, no, it's not that, but it's like, he should have had an edge on him once we got Laura confronting him later on in the story, spoilers. Um, when Laura confronts him later, I don't feel like he had enough of an edge. But to be fair, I also simultaneously kind of like perceived danger but not actually dangerous as long as you can recognize your own strength in making a choice so that like fits in though you know i mean it does again as a metaphor it's like okay do i sell my soul to not remember the horrors i've seen is a coherent reading of the ma what what the magical element is saying about the war and ptsd it's just it's a very obvious one and so i keep cringing away from it and I it's just that. like, I was like, really? Like, it's just, it's just, it's very obvious. That's what everyone thinks about war. It's not about like the devil offers them a brotherhood that they no longer feel they have. Or again, I think, I think ideas of sin and virtue in a personal sense versus an impersonal would be really. So I just, I, it, it to me, it like, it doesn't hit like so much of this book. It's good. And she's very talented, but it doesn't hit. It doesn't, I don't feel it in my gut. There are some places where I felt that as well, but there are so many other places that I personally enjoyed so thoroughly that it made up for it. So I really like this book. It just isn't like, I almost feel like I can't even feel the same feelings I used to feel for some stories, that like emotional depth. I don't know if it's just that we haven't read it or if I just can't feel it, but. I have also kind of wondered about that because often I don't feel anything for stories, but every once in a while we come across a good book and I'm like, oh, I'm back in it. When me and when me and Maria were reading the Keys to the Kingdom books, I was like, no, I want to sit here and read this. I don't want to watch YouTube instead. Well, I was listening to it, but like, I was like, no, I need to, I know what happens, but I really want to read the next part. So it, it really, and it's funny because Angry Otter and a couple, shout out, of other of our patrons have mentioned that like we've ruined books for them. And I think like that's true to an extent. We've ruined things for ourselves by looking at it uh, like, you know, but also strategically. You you gain you so much. Not you only do. do you gain confidence in your media literacy, 
which I think is a super valuable skill that a lot of people yeah. don't have. I myself have gained a lot of confidence in my own opinions, which is funny. I'm sure a lot of you reading this, watching this are like, did you ever have a non-confidence in your opinions? Yeah, I used to be much more insecure about like, oh, I like a song of ice and fire, but maybe it's not good. And now I'm like, no, I know exactly what it's good at. And I can tell you those things step by step. And there's something to be said for that kind of confidence. And then also you can appreciate the, the, the notes of wood and gravel in wine more now you know what i mean like you can enjoy a really great work in uh, you can appreciate it in a way you couldn't before you can understand different facets of it yeah you can't go to 7-eleven like anymore and get that boxed wine and enjoy that on a nice friday <sighs> evening instead you have to go looking i don't know though because i was reading some fanfic the other day and i was like ah oh, still got it <laughs> Me too. but to be fair they're Me also too. fanfic just like not all fanfic but some fanfic is like so well written compared to what we're reading oh my god isn't that wild immediately the sex scenes were better getting back to the actual book at play here um so what happens next is that there's a bunch of bullshit that happens with uh, like- Let me summarize it. Let me okay. summarize it. Let me summarize it. Okay, so we've gotten to the point where basically Laura has gotten to the chateau. She's been nursed. She met Dr. Jones, blah, blah, blah. Fallon is slowly nom-nomming on Freddy's memories one by one. And Freddy slowly but surely is losing confidence in himself because he's like, wow, I, I really am weak and pathetic over time. And he's just like, I am not who I was. I'm not- I'm not who uh, as good as I was. Like there is really no point, and it does make sense. It's not too pity me, pity me, but it does edge the line a little. And so anyway, that's Freddy. Basically, it doesn't really matter what happens to Freddy in this world at this point. Like, uh, no, it doesn't. Like, I mean, I, I like some of the interactions. You get the gist that Fallon is like this old world creature. You know, you get a little bit more of his lore, like fanned out before you. Not much, but a little. And you get the vibe that Fallon, Fallon really wants to like fuck freddy's memories like but not freddy <laughs> that's exactly what it's like and i was like are we going further into this gay theme or i'm like but no 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 maybe that's not what the author is trying yeah, no, to do he's, just, he's seductive in nature in the fact of the codependence and reliance that he wants freddy to have on it's him. very catholic in terms of like it's there's a subtle undercurrent of sexual energy and but also there's the pathos and human connection and warmth but it's like the uh, the the manipulation and abuse of it you mm -hmm. know and so anyway um so there you know there's freddy um, but, uh, Laura in the meantime, um, is slowly falling in love with Dr. Jones. Love it. It's great. Not going to linger on that. You can go read it if you want to have that because it's totally worth it and not only cheap and anything else. Um, and so, uh, Laura, uh, a Pim is constantly going out and secret and trying to figure out more about Fallon. It's because she wants to pursue that image she saw in the mirror slash. She just also is obviously very like upset by a lot of things and she feels unmoored because she followed Mary and Laura to the chateau with no experience or anything, just because she's lost everything. So, you know, she's kind of unmoored and you can slowly see her descent into not a, like a madness madness, but like an anger madness she cuts her beautiful long victorian hair and you're like oh yeah. i know this from tv tropes it does make sense she doesn't want to be beautiful anymore to the people who she feels is responsible for her uh, son's death which we'll find later on um but uh so anyway um Laura also goes out seeking information. Long story short, she picks up some breadcrumb cl clues about the fact that Freddie could be alive. And then we get our name drop of the title while she's talking to her old friend Kate, who is the nurse that Freddie gave the jacket and dog tags to and was like, um, yo, this German dude, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Kate is like, um, something, something about something of the warm hands of ghosts and blah, blah, blah. And We've really skipped over this, but I really want to highlight this right now um, because it's something that made an impact on me. So all this time, Laura keeps getting haunted by the image of her mother. And her mother, when she died, was at home, but the home was up near the docks and there was a giant explosion of a ship. Her father was one of the people trying to save the sailors and died as well. But her mother, she ended up finding afterwards because she had a panic attack because of the the explosion because of the war and everything she was back from her wound um and so by the time she got to her mother mother was like basically gone mother has a shredded face with like a shit ton of uh shards of glass in it to the point where she doesn't even have a face anymore so it's quite terrifying honestly red but gaping again, holes where her eyes used to be problem is is like that's not effective horror horror wise <laughs> none of that hit me and so if you're really scared easily or uh, or squicked out this is not gonna probably bother you or vague, yeah. like not as extreme you know what actually grossed me out more and it's a book that's far inferior but house of salt and sorrows horror I sections i felt hit harder than this one did yeah it did 
you're you're right. It's grosser. Uh, she, uh, Catherine Arden isn't gross. Uh, she's not a gross writer. And she needs I to even found the grandma vamp, uh, zombie from um, Baron the Nightingale to be better than this, which again is a, is kind of a weird like. I don't know quite why it didn't work here. Who knows? I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it would be interesting. It would be interesting to discuss, though, on a written level. So her mother had glass in her face, and her mother's ghost has been basically haunting her this whole time, and she's terrified of the ghost every time she sees it. And when she's living the three old hags at the early beginning, and they're like supposed old to be old like, ladies. It's three. It's it's the golden years. Excuse you. Hags. Okay, fine. Old ladies, whatever. They're definitely witches. Everyone. They're actual witches. It's because they actually visit her in her dreams, even though she. Doesn't doesn't know like she doesn't believe in any of that but the point is is they're like wow the or so, somebody at some point is like the ghosts follow you and so she has like a whole train of all these ghosts following her which i really like the concept of but that, again that is a theme that is not actually never explored that that is, seems like a really big theme and i thought the ghosts were going to come more together to aid her against fallon towards the end because that was so highlighted not that i need that but that's what was highlighted and it just didn't come up instead the ghosts assist her so anyway the reason i say this right is that so her mom keeps coming up as this horrific figure but slowly but surely through everything that happens she learns that through vinta as well because vinta is on the run with one arm now yeah he lost his arm um so anyway he uh is it doesn't matter. The point is, is that Vinta <laughs> ends up, it doesn't, like, you can go read it. It's fine. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is through plot mechanisms, Vinta ends up, through Freddy's perspective, you learn uh, how it happens. Um, Vinta ends up at the chateau with Laura and them. And so they end up helping Vinta. And Vinta, you know, tells her a little bit about what's going on, but not much. And so he lets her know, hey, you need to trust the ghosts because there are ghosts in this world. And the ghosts of the old world will help, uh, you know, what blah, blah, blah stuff. And so, like, listen to your heart, you know? And uh, anyway, we get to the point where... Um, the uh, queen of uh, Deutschland, uh, or whatever, um, is coming. Denmark <laughs> is uh, coming, and she. It's like so for this like charity thing, and so they're gonna get a lot of money from it. So Mary, hospital person, friends with Pim, uh, is like super stoked. It's because she's gonna get some funding, and uh, Jones is like, oh, I'm helping Vita because I love you, basically. But like, we're not getting that. It's not that cheesy. But he's like, yes, I will help this German dude. It's because he apparently knows what's gonna happen to your brother. And the thing is, thematically, this is supposed to be, and because we know it's thematically because the book says it. Laura being like, oh my God, there's still kindness in humanity and and basic trust, and this is really like breathing life into me. And I'm like, I didn't really feel like you had lost that. There was still a lot of humanity. I didn't either. Yeah, I, I was like, either. what? And I, and I was like, but also, he just kind of wants to bang you, so. It, devalues it a little bit okay it's not just that everyone shut up jones is perfect in every way william shut up let me continue look 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 i am staking out i am not ace or arrow but i am staking it out here romance it's a, it's a crude monkey instinct that devalues humanity vinta's in the hospital and then like you know they try to shove him in a corner while the queen's there and there's like you know the guy that pim talked to the general guy that made her upset is there and there's other characters and whatever and um all of a sudden out of nowhere vinta and pim are like fighting over a gun and vinta's like i don't regret it and they all assume obviously with his german accent you're immediately like oh he was trying to get the gun away from pim like immediately yeah, you you're know. like okay that's what's happening and then we're gonna faff around for like four more chapters not knowing yeah that was annoying that was a little annoying but it's fine i like it should have been a little different so it was more mysterious honestly because then the shock of it would have been way more fun but whatever mm -hmm. it's fine um the point is though um is after that vinta as he's like passing out or whatever or getting taken away or whatever is like he's here doing this and she looks out the window there's fallon she runs after him and this is like my favorite part in the whole book almost i think is when she goes up to him she, uh, and she looks outside and she doesn't know where he went and there's a ghost out in the like uh, in the woods area pointing in a direction and so she just she's like fuck it i know the ghosts are so I i'm seeing things there are things happening freddy's alive i think i'm going for it and so she just makes her decision which is so f refreshing and she runs after fallon she doesn't just catch up with him weakly she grabs him by the arm and swings him around and is like where's my brother and i love it and then he's just like i love how determined she is in this moment it's so clean how like fallon just keeps trying to like you know like be a little asshole to her and then she's just like no let's go yeah let's go no let's go 
I'm ready. Let's go. Like, she's just like, I don't care what you have to say. We're going. And so she goes there. She finds Freddy. Freddy's, as you might expect, a shell, a shell of his former self. Um, and then she's like, uh, come on, we got to get you out. It's really like, I like actually the interaction. It feels realistic. I don't know if my, my dislike of Freddy is tinging it, but I was like, He's a little too like, oh no, I'm, I, again, I feel like this would be more effective if we didn't have his viewpoint um, this whole time. Because I, again, I feel like it would be like, oh, okay, we can see him from a distance and we can conceptualize that whatever happened in his past was too awful even for us to understand. I wanted him to be creepier in this moment is the problem. I wanted him to be unknown to her. But the thing is, we we were in his head a chapter before this and he was just his normal weepy that's, self. That's the problem though, you know? And so anyway, obviously there's some trial they have to get through. So anyway, she starts opening doors and there are things to his memories and her memories. And obviously Fallon's like trying to like shock, scare them away from trying to get out. But they keep opening doors and slowly one by one, he remembers each of the memories or at least he isn't really, he just is reliving them. And he's brave enough to have to relive them to get to a certain point. And so long story short, they win their freedom. They get out, they get out of the hotel, Fallon's hotel, and they're in the middle of like a nowhere. Like it's not a real place. Like they're obviously like in the shadow verse of the realms. And um, they don't know where to go. Uh, uh, I keep wanting to call him Jimmy. Freddie is like, you know, kind of like, I don't know where we are, Laura. And Laura's like, I don't know either. But then she remembered what Vinta said about following the ghosts. And so she's like, and like the way it's just brought up, it's just so good. And I really wish there were other things that were cleaner and well put together because this scene would have literally made me actually hurt cry if that were the case. But she was just like, mama, uh, like, you know, something. And it wasn't cheesy, in my opinion, it was good. And then her mom comes, puts a hand on her shoulder and she doesn't look at her mother because she doesn't want to look at her for the face and feel the guilt and everything for it. And uh, they like, she leads her out and then they get out. And then super fast forward so we can wrap this up. They get out of the dream realm or whatever and it's like, okay, it, that was weirdly anticlimactic. It was, it was. I'm not gonna lie, it was. The thing is like, you really need to do weird LSD dreams if you're gonna be doing this kind of thing. And this just felt very mundane. I think a lot of it is that Laura is such a solid, pragmatic character that you are never really like worried about her and her mind state is always very clear. We really, I mean, honestly, we should have been from Freddie's perspective on this chapter and we should have been cut off from his chapters midway into the book, got his chapter on this maybe. I don't know, because then you also don't see the shell of him either so that doesn't work either i guess again i think freddy could have just been cut entirely and i mean oh, actually up. his character he should have just been dead at the beginning anyway um so um the adventure has been captured jones is like way too helpful to people who are like very clearly deserters and traitors no he's not no he's not remember his character already as a doctor i guess i it strained it a little bit for he's me he's very much non-traditional it, it, yeah but it, it started being a little into main character syndrome of characters gonna help you even regardless of the fact that like it could affect the whole hospital yeah but that but jones it's not jones hospital like he cares about his patients but the thing is is the fact that laura was right about her brother and she brought him into the hospital speaks volumes for something strange going on and I think is enough evidence to him for his trust in her for him to go along with it. So it, it's believable I mean, to me. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't completely unbelievable. I was just like a little bit your hand yes, is showing. I agree. It is a little easy. Yeah. Vinter got captured afterwards and they're going to go see him because Pim can like has been charming one of the generals or whatever and has gone. The general she wants to like. She doesn't like see. very much. She's been like seducing his nephew so they can go see him. And she's like, oh, I have a piece of information. And Mary's like, Laura has to go. And she's like, I don't want Laura to go. And Laura's like, I'm coming. And you're like, okay, clearly Pim is up to something. All right. Um, basically, they get to the place and then Pim tries to, uh, takes the gun and puts it to the general's head when they're like all alone. And you realize that what had happened is that what Fallon had shown her, or I think of the general, no, I think of the general told her. Yeah, the general told her. And this is a real thing that happened, this story that I'm going to tell. Um, <gasps> really? It's not this general and this soldier, but the interaction is in that podcast they talked about. It's a thing that happened, which is that her her son had run away, had retreated, had not retreated, he'd run away, and they were taking him to be shot for cowardice or, or desertion. And the general had stopped him and gone like, look, son, it's you should not have shame in this moment. We have to do this because this is the system in play. Like the morale cannot be broken in this way, but you are providing a service for your country, even in your death. Um, and the thing is, 
in the book, this is treated as the rich not understanding the poor and devaluing their lives. I don't think it's the rich not understanding the poor. It's because remember where he, like, Pim comes from a rich background. So it's not rich versus poor. It's just who you are in the system. Yeah, like, oh, the general gets to say that this is a necessary thing, but like, uh, you know, yeah. that kind of whole theme. And like, when I heard this story originally in that podcast, I was like, oh, wow, they really did think about the world in a different way. And like, that's such an interesting idea that as long as you keep to the system, there's no shame and punishment. Like there's no, there, there shouldn't be shame and punishment. And that's such a, like an old world way of looking at it. And I thought it was really interesting and actually like, the, the, again, the book views it as dehumanizing and I, I don't quite see it that way in terms of the original story. Well, I didn't see it as dehumanizing in this story. I just, I, that's so, okay, so. I, I understand Catherine Arden was probably painting it that way, but you know what's funny is despite that, I didn't even see it that way. I saw it as Pim, a mother who was highly variable and super subjective to the situation at hand, lost her mind in the nature of what is required for this in this era, and she was selfish enough to want to kill a man because of it. You know, that's actually, that that is a much better reading because... Or I don't know if it's a much better reading. I'm saying it's a much more interesting idea because you're right. That would tie into if there was a theme of personal versus systemic of like. Well, that's what I thought was happening in the book. But see, that's the thing is the the the, the general. Nobody ever makes the case like, look, I get it. It sucks. But this is what has to happen. Like what we're an army of rules. You know, what's weird, though, is there are some moments in characterization of the characters that inherently imply that, which is interesting. So I think what it is, is I think it's Catherine Arden having a picture. And then denying that picture in the character's individual experiences themselves. So she's doing both, which makes it appear messy, even though she's trying to have a multifaceted perspective on it. I think the framework is there. I just don't quite think she connected the dots. Like the dots are kind of there. And so you're like, oh, they kind of connect. But again, usually you would have had a character voice that kind of an argument of like, look, we can't have people. This is a danger to the, his other soldiers. His life isn't worth more than other people's. They, you know, you can't have soldiers running away. I think that's a, a theme that's nascent, but isn't quite borne out by the novel. But I also think that if you're a really good reader, I think you can enjoy this book on that level with what she's provided. If you are not a very good reader, like, and I don't even mean like, oh, you're, you're not a good reader. What I mean is just an experienced reader that can pick up on those smaller things. If you are not, I'll say experienced. If you are not an experienced reader, then yeah, you would miss those things. And so they would have to be more spelled out. And in, theoretically, uh, structurally speaking, you should have that. Structurally speaking, you should have it. However, that being said, it's kind of like, you know, like when um, artisans or, you know, like when there's like a meal that technically tastes bad, but you eat it because the the technicality of having it is like there's multifacets to it. And so you're supposed to appreciate the multifacets rather than the overall picture. No, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking I Usually I understand your food metaphors, but like yeah, I eat like Taco Bell when I eat out. Okay, I have no idea what you're talking about. What I'm talking about, or you can use it for any art. You can use it for any art medium. Uh, for example, um, uh, uh, abstract art. I don't like using the app. Okay, I don't want to use abstract art as an example, though. I want to use food still. So, a example. Taco Bell menu. Limit yourself to that. No. I have gone... Okay, wait. Okay, fine. 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 Um, I don't eat at Taco Bell. I have no relation. Can't do it. Anti-Hispanic bias. It's kind of like when I would go to... Um, I, I, my husband and I really like going to frou frou places where you get like an eight your course meal. And that's like what we save up for every year is one of those. And so uh, because I really like the wine pairings and the liquor pa pairings and stuff like that. However, I've had many different experiences now with just even three visits to these kind of places. Um, to some of these places I've gone and I've tried these things. I've eaten something that I didn't like. But when I ate only one of those, the other ones were, oh, they were so good. But anyway, point is. I ate something. I did not like it. Ob like, subjectively speaking, I did not like it. I don't like dark meat. I think it tastes slimy to me. I know that's very white of me. Uh, her husband, Juan, is Dominican, by the way. Just mm -hmm. let that sit there. He makes a lot of dark meat chicken, and I just can't do it. Not what I meant, but go ahead. You're so dumb. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to say it every time. It annoys me so much <laughs> that I have to do that, but it's almost like a compulsion. I'll eat something that doesn't taste good, but for the sake of appreciating the artistry that went into it, type of thing, you know what I mean? Like, I I eat the thing 
I don't actually like the taste of dark meat, but I can appreciate, oh, wow, I taste that whatever seasoning that's in it. And I can see that it's been cooked beautifully and like whatever. So I appreciate the technicality of it, but I don't appreciate the overall taste of it. And that's kind of like almost like what this is like, I guess. It's because it doesn't fit one to one with the metaphor, like with the analogy I'm trying to keep, create here. I think I get I think I get what you're talking about. Yeah. You say, you know, like as an experienced reader. You can enjoy this far more than an unexperienced reader because you can f find all the little notes that she put in there even though they were not strategically well done done. I see what you're saying. I don't necessarily agree because I think to an extent they just don't come together, which is a problem. See, I just have a different philosophy on it, I think. Yeah, I think so. I mean, because the thing is, I don't think those notes are... So in the, I would argue that the notes are things like her prose. Even if the yeah. work as a whole doesn't work, I can see her prose. But I really just don't think that's how we're supposed to read it. I really do think we're supposed to read it as, aren't, don't the upper classes kind of suck? Oh, uh, I guess I just have a different assumption of what I think she tried. I like yours better. Like, I think that actually is a lot more interesting, but, I, but it was not the one I went in with or the one I was reading it with. Anyway, she kills the general. Uh, Ro uh, I was going to say Rosalind. Pimp kills the general. Um, Holland shows up. It's not Holland. It's Fallon? Fallon. Fallon. I don't know. I, I remember that the whole time. I've forgotten now. He shows up and he's like, ooh, you have some delicious memories. And she's like, get my friends out and I'll go with you. And Laura looks in her eyes and realizes there is a madness there. And you're like, it's kind of weird that the character who actually was at war the least was the one who, like, is supposed to... Sh to show the madness that war can cause. Like it's it's like a little, I didn't feel like thematically that made a ton amount of sense. That's a, that's not how I took it at all. Oh my gosh. I took it much more- oh, How did you read it? I, much smaller in scope. I read it as a woman who can't handle the world. It's because she was part of the old world just like Fallon was. And so she's no longer part of the new world. Not literally, but she like, just like, as far as like, she just doesn't really have anything and she's lost sight of herself and her friend. Like, you know, she found a lot of kinship with Laura, but it wasn't enough to stave off the anger that came from the general. It's because all this time she's been building her friendship with Laura, but simultaneously, and her skills as a nurse and doing really good things for the soldiers that she finds very, very comforting and fulfilling. But simultaneously, she can't let go of that anger. And so it's more of like an individualized thing rather than a thematic thing for in, it, in my mind, but I understand why you read it thematically. Well, I mean, I actually think that's very interesting if you go back to the theme of apocalypse and that this has been not a material apocalypse, but an emotional apocalypse for her and that she has lost everything and she can't handle that. I mean, I think there's, uh, again, I don't think that's what's intended, but it's a, it's a very, because like, otherwise we would have had to get more of what the world was like and then shown more of the cost of losing her son and husband and all of that. See, but I just think Arden's skill level in displaying this isn't up to par for what she wants. And so I think she did some of it, but not all of it. I mean, I think that's a good point. I do think you're, we're supposed to understand her grief as motivating her here. I actually think there's kind of an interesting idea of like, going back to just, I just thought of this and it's not really connected to what I was saying, but in terms of like, you know, if this is an Armageddon and after the Armageddon, the, you know, the beast will rise from the sea and the devil walks the earth. Like that's such an interesting idea that like, maybe this has freed the devil or something like that. That could be. That's how I read it. He's just kind of like always been around, I think, is in the lore, essentially. You know what's weird? There's something about it. So I know I'm probably wrong. Maybe I'm filling it in in my head. Um, but there's a certain nature to when Freddy meets Fallon for the first time. And he and uh, Vinta are like, you know, trying to find a place for themselves to sneak and hide and rest. And they see Fallon uh, in this newspaper mill uh, for the war. And it's for this paper that does a whole bunch of like really dark humor for all the soldiers and stuff. And that's what it is, it's just dark humor. And like, it's like the onion, basically. If you know what the onion is, um, it's all false stories for like, humor's sake but it's dark humor and so um uh which is funny in and of itself with fallon going there but he wants to post an ad to come at, uh, to his hotel and i that in and of itself that he's like i don't know there's just something weird about that comboed with the fact that vinta and um Freddie follow him because he's like, oh, yeah, I have a place, I think, if it still exists. He's like, if this place still exists, I have a place for you to spend the night. And he goes and he finds this old wine cellar. And when he finds the wine cellar, it's old and dank and dusty and sad. And it's even danker and dustier in the morning, too. And um, but there was a certain amount of gothic elegance to it that Freddie remembers in, like, when Fallon was there. And then when Fallon leaves, it's, like, kind of, like, more decayed and decrepit. But... That, like, gave me this weird inclination that he was asleep 
and he has awoken. I mean, I think that's interesting. I, I didn't get that sense because he talks about like how he was drawn here, but not necessarily. But I, I had gotten true. the sense that he was but kind I saw of it from always around. No, I mean, I, I think that makes sense. I think also the, the devil now being unleashed by the apocalypse, like it would be more interesting if the devil like didn't like it here that much or found that like his powers were useless or again it's never the, f the fiddling is such a lame power for why did she do a fiddle is it because of the old fiddler notion of the devil i think it plays into certain like folktale type of it's a very folk lyric kind of pied piper feeling of like oh the fiddler made them dance all night i mean i get why she went for it it's a gentle approach you know who i mostly thought of is from futurama the robot devil who's like nur, 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 nur. he has oh, like a fiddle God. Yes. or a flute i think or yes, something like I that. Remember that i kind of understand though why i feel like arden did that because this devil doesn't have any real power unless you give it to him and i think that's important yes but what he should do with that power should be way cooler than like a fiddle song. But see, this is the problem we get into with a classic novel versus like, say, a high fantasy novel or something like that. This is where the themes, I feel like, start interrupting each other. It's because you have that classic representation where things are bigger than what they seem because they're smaller. They're just like symbolism pieces. Whereas when you have an actual fantasy setting, these things actually power and there are fights and there are rules to these things no you're actually correct this is a problem that historical uh fantasy constantly has and especially like urban fantasy where there's like a secret underworld is okay the magic should be affecting things but it can't affect things because it still needs to be our history and if and then so like maybe it was like also a secret war between the warlocks and the elves or something but they can't have affected their and then you're like kind of devaluing the actual event that happened yep. and you're like yep. this is kind of just like a weird problem these books have and yeah. so like i think that's why i was like okay this is going to be a metaphor because it can't actually be a thing he's doing because then it's a th yeah, anyway um but anyway yeah mostly um they get home fine um Venter and uh, Freddy make out. And I was like, okay. Again, I think this would actually help the book if it was just much earlier that you got that Freddy was gay. Because then it, like his motivations make more sense. I felt like it was really clear for me, but I also am like a gaydar. I thought the author was trying to say something about like human intimacy and the, the generality of it. And instead it was like, no, it was kind of hormones. Which, whatever. Um, also, he has like fire and brimstone parents. And yet Freddy is like totally like, he never thinks about his own homosexuality as as like weird or a repressed thing when like if you have fire and brimstone parents that's gonna affect how you think about it in this time period i feel like it for sure i feel like that was super skipped over was the self-hatred that he should have had for the homosexuality i mean that's the thing is that really in that time period and with religious parents that should actually his homosexuality should actually be a big deal but it's it, it, I don't think she wants to talk about that. She wants to talk about World War One. And this is the thing is that in certain books, you can in, insert queer characters without it really um, being uh, a thing you need to talk about. So one example, um, and I hate to give it credit, but it's just the one I thought of. The Cyborg Tinkerer has a trans character. Not a thing you need to explore. Not really. It's just a thing that happens in that world and it's cool. Um, a lot of settings can just have like, hey, we're not homophobic in this setting and it's fine. But this is a real historical event and you chose to give him parents who are very fierily religious and would be homophobic. And so that is a thing you kind of need to talk like, about. Why else would they would. But yeah, but why else? I almost feel like why else did you mention the parents being religious if you weren't going to implement that in that way in his character building? Because here's the problem. You run into a problem. So you, you work backwards from, okay, he's gay. He had fiery parents. So he must have had a lot of um, the turmoil that comes with being closeted. Okay, is that why he joined the army? To get away from, yeah. if, if with his own self-disgust and uncomfortability. Um, or he may have tried to join the Navy and wasn't able to in the navy i unironically like that song but like okay if he's joining the military to flee society for disliking him for who he is then that says something about the society beforehand and then what does that say in the metaphor of the world war as a system like it gets really messy and it's just it like does. if you're not going to spend time I don't see how it would synergize with the other themes. Not that you couldn't write a book like that. I think a book like that would be very interesting. Um, but I can see why the author was like, I don't want to have to engage with that. But it's like, you kind of have to engage with it. I don't know. I think a lot of people will think it's fine. You don't have to engage with it. But by not engaging with it, you are leaving a loose end in a way. And somebody's going to comment on it. And so you just have to be prepared for that. I, I think what she should have done is cut the religious parents. Because she actually doesn't do a lot with... With it. 
it, like he can be gay. It's fine. He could be. They could have cool parents that are like, oh, I love our gay son. Like that's fine. Or even just non-religious. In case, in which case, he would probably just be closeted, but not like self-loathing kind of a type of thing. I also felt like that should have played in more with his relationship with Fallon too. He should have had more. Like I, I wish there was more seductive nature. See, that's the problem. Then, then it's like, okay, the gay devil is trying to tempt you with homosexuality from the world that hates you for what it is, and like yeah. that gets into being a comp. But that's a complicated theme that it has nothing to do with. World War One. See again. That's the that's the problem. Is again. There's a lot of there's a lot of works where you can just include a queer character and it's fine. But in this one, you're specifically working with a setting where that constrains what you're trying to say. So I mean, again, I think without religious parents, it becomes a little bit less of a problem. But um, yeah. So him and Venture are gay. Um, they go back to Halifax. Him and Venture are like, I know you saved our life, Laura, but peace out and laura's like she tried not to be selfish about it oh you didn't get to this part yeah they left yeah they go back to halifax and it's like oh but he can't ever really belong here anymore he, you know he's they left here. laura and so they're like we got to peace out to a small farm somewhere and she's like she tried to not be selfish about having saved him and not him not wanting her anymore and i'm like no bitch be selfish that's so bullshit what did you go through all this for i'm sorry fuck freddie <laughs> yeah, like fuck that dude I, are you serious like wait can she not yeah. well, well i look if she's gonna go visit them and stuff and then they just want to live out in the middle of nowhere that's fine that makes sense because they're gay i mean where are they gonna fucking live where they're accepted but see the thing is like fuck that stay with your sister be cool she went through like literal hell to find you yeah but if her but okay but it depends how it's free framed it's because if she's gonna go after jones in america then th she's fine well okay so that's the other thing that happened is that her and jones made out before they left um i know and so the last scene is is a man shows up at her door bunny months after her brothers left and says hey i came here to to uh, fulfill my promise and it's him and like yeah it's cute i wish it would have been more of a a little a little less romantic and a little bit more like oh this oh, is a new beginning I, for them i guess but like but no it like is it. it's sweet it's cute. I like again it. i i'm standing up for arrow and ace people as your champion in this case down with the couplers they should have a derogatory name for people in relationships like the conjoined yeah, they call them like the conjoined. The conjoined. That's the, someone to call. <laughs> if you know any weird names to call um, people in relationships, let me know in the comments below. It's the below. conjoined now. Conjoined. I'm going to call them the conjoined. Yeah, again, I don't think this is a bad book. I think this is a good book. I think the themes don't come together. I don't think the the plot is helped by having Freddy in it, but I, I understand reading it and liking it. I really do. Everyone, this is a 9 out of 10 for me. It's between 91 and 199%. It's this, this would be... A, a lukewarm for me except we've read so many bad books that it's actually a little bit higher because i just appreciate actually having wanted to read it and not having to disassociate while i read it i highly recommend regardless as long as you like stories with the elements we've discussed i think you will absolutely love this novel you will not regret reading it is it the most perfect book will it be your most favorite book ever maybe not but uh, it's definitely in my top 10. Really? Oh, like, yeah, yeah, since yeah. we the started the podcast, or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, like, probably okay. number 9, number 10. But, like, the point is, is that it's definitely on top 10 material because I, I just... God, I love Laura and Jones. <laughs> I really do. It is cute. Like... I love. I just want to read fan fiction on them now. Honestly, I'm a little caught up by the fan fiction element of it, but, like... I really like this book. I, uh, well, uh, Will's not wrong. I don't love the Freddy chapters. I think they have a purpose and I think their purpose could have been honed more. But that being said, the whole the book as a whole is thoroughly enjoyable for those of us who like the stuff that we do. I would say, please go read it if you haven't. And um, join our Patreon. Again, me and Katie will probably do the first dark part with, with Freddy. I think that's a good idea because uh, it, the, it is missing something. And those critique sessions are a very, um, a really good tool to be able to hone in on specifics. Um, also, Katie has kind of started a bit of a writing group in, in the Discord. We're calling it Katie's Fiction Corner, KFC. KFC, become part of the little chickadees. All right, we love you, our parasocial darlings. Bye.